So um, just a few administrative comments before we move to the agenda. Uh, today, um, our physical location is at the Waterbury State Office Complex on the second floor in the ASH conference room, if anyone wants to come join us. Um, next week, we'll be back at the um, Agency of Agriculture. Um, we're going to have our meeting on Thursday, July 15th at 9.30 and we're gonna be discussing energy use and environmental issues. Um, just remind folks that we do currently have two positions posted. Um, we have a general counsel position. Um, that application period closes on July 19th and we have an administrative services coordinator position which closes on July 13th. I wanted to mention that we're going to be holding an executive session today. It's an extended one. Um, we're going to be meeting with um, our finalists for our consulting position. Um, and hopefully we'll have a decision on that. We can announce who that is uh, relatively soon afterwards uh, once we work out a few of the details. Um, there's two names left uh, that have yet to be named on our advisory committee. Once we have those names, we will uh, post that full list to our website. And uh, just with respect to our executive director, Bryn Hare, she's wrapping up with Ledge Council, I think tomorrow, um, and then taking a week off, and she'll be starting with us on the 18th. Uh, one last thing, I, I mentioned this last week, um, our address, uh, our physical address for the board itself is gonna be changing. It was 12 Baldwin um, in Montpelier. It's now going to be 89 Main Street in Montpelier. So um, today we're going to continue uh, our fact finding into some of the priorities that we identified in Act 164 and Act 62. Um, this meeting today is dedicated to effective prevention and education strategies, particularly with respect to youth. Um, and then also we're going to hear about advertising and how that's been working in other states. Um, this is an area of particular concern to the board. You know, when I first started thinking about cannabis policy, I met with almost every cabinet secretary at the time to discuss how an adult use system might impact his or her agency and its core mission. Um, and from a policy perspective, my meeting with the um, health commissioner at the time, Dr. Chen, was probably one of the most challenging for me and really stuck with me. Um, his team was showing me the negative trends that DOH tracks regarding perception of harm of cannabis um, among middle school and high school students, as well as their ease of access. And essentially, as cannabis has become more normalized in the country um, over the past few decades and years, um, you know, the trends were showing that kids felt that A, it was not harmful and B, that it was easier to get their hands on than some other regulated products like tobacco and alcohol. So Dr. Chen never came on board um, with the idea of creating a regulatory framework for cannabis in Vermont, but he did agree with us at the time that it was time to um, kind of face some of these challenges and these negative trends head on, uh, and he needed the kind of resources in order to do that. So we dedicated in the bill that I worked on 25% of all tech cannabis revenue to the Department of Health in order to um, develop prevention programs, kind of fill the gaps in those, and also counter marketing initiatives. Uh, Act, 64, Act 164 dedicates 30% of the uh, excise tax to the Department of Health, and it's capped at $10 million. Um, <clears throat> We have a really incredible slate of witnesses today to help update us on some of the trends um, that we've been seeing in the state and nationally, um, to help us think about the challenges ahead and how the board can um, meet these challenges head on. And um, importantly, what sort of prevention, education, and counter, counter marketing strategies are effective in this space. Um, just as a quick aside, uh, a number of witnesses that have been working in this space for decades, including <clears throat> Dr. Levine um, and the Vermont Medical Society could not join us today. I just wanna remind um, everyone who's watching that today really is just the beginning of this conversation. Um, 
and that ensuring a safe rollout of the adult use program is core to our mission as a cannabis control board. And we will be revisiting this issue as a board and through our advisory committee again and again. Um, so I'd like to just move to the agenda now. Uh, our first order is to approve our minutes from last week. Um, I'll move to approve the minutes from the July 1st meeting. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so our first witness, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I see that Dr. Vol Volante has joined us. Uh, Dr. Volante is a PhD, MPH, um, and an associate professor at uh, the departments of psychiatry and psychology at the University of Vermont. Um, I've known her from her incredible work to help that she's done to help our legislature craft good policy. Um, and I consider her um, the foremost expert um, in the state and probably the country on issues related to um, young adult tobacco use, cessation, prevention, and counter marketing. Um, and now that we're starting to collect reliable data in other adult use states, I think she's actually started to observe some trends with respect to cannabis usage. Um, so, Dr. Volanti, I don't want to take up any more of your time, um, but if you could maybe just introduce yourself for the record quickly and, uh, and um, help us kind of start to wrap our heads around some of these issues. Of course. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Andrea Volanti. I am a faculty member at the University of Vermont. Um, and the work that I do is largely focused on youth and young adult tobacco use, though I've expanded my work um, into substance use more broadly as we've had uh, more uh, recreational cannabis coming through uh, the U.S. So I will uh, share my screen. Great. That worked. <laughs> yeah, we can see that. Thank you. Okay. So um, are you seeing the slides? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so uh, this is my disclosure slide. I, I uh, am funded by the National Institutes on Health, the FDA, HRSA. I will not be talking about any um, uh, I don't have any industry funding. I'm not going to be talking about any off-label medication use, et cetera. Um, so just again, my areas of focus are kind of threefold. Uh, first, youth and young adult substance use and cessation. I oversee the PACE Vermont study, which I'll talk about more during this session in collaboration with the Vermont Department of Health. Um, we have funding for that study from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. I've also been doing work on socioeconomically disadvantaged young adult smokers and improving their cessation. I do a lot of work in the field, a new field of tobacco regulatory science that I think is very applicable to the world of cannabis, cannabis regulatory science, which is also emerging. Um, and I am very interested in methods and measures and how we do better in our data collection to basic to evaluate and inform our public health policies and programs. So why is a tobacco researcher talking to you about cannabis? Um, one of the reasons is that we see a lot of parallels between what might be coming for um, the cannabis environment and the tobacco industry, especially as it relates to the tobacco industry participating in the cannabis um, uh, environment. And so this is a paper that came out in 2014 um, that documented a number of um, documents in the that the industry had produced through the 1970s and 80s about how they could capitalize on um, uh, legalized marijuana. Uh, this is a more recent opinion piece in the Boston Globe from a few months ago. Um, just documenting that the tobacco industry is really engaged in this field and is um, investing in, in cannabis companies and in products that could um, maximize their distribution of cannabis. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, is kind of two broad, broad buckets. First is looking at surveillance. Um, in adolescents and young adults, looking at data from the U.S. broadly, and then looking at data in Vermont. And then also just um, more briefly, since there's less data on this, 
uh, talking about cannabis marketing and counter marketing and kind of giving broad strokes on where I think we need to go in our state. So overall, past year initiation of substance use by age group, you can see here for cigarettes, alcohol, and marijuana. Um, this is data from 2019 from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, and what you can see here is that the youth, um, the blue bars who are 12 to 17 and the young adults age 18 to 25 are the groups that have the largest initiation of past year substance use. And you can see these numbers for cigarettes, alcohol, and marijuana. There's very little initiation after the age of 26 in this data. Additionally, the mean age of first substance use among past year initiates generally falls within the young adult age group. So generally, we thought of uh, youth uh, age 12 to 17, adolescents as the group where most initiation starts. What we can see here is that it actually spans adolescence and young adulthood with most of uh, initiation occurring uh, across substances in that young adult group. So broadly, we've been looking at trends overall um, and thinking about how the order in which substances are used may influence uptake of other products. And so this is data, um, again, from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health from 1976 through 2016, I believe, looking at the likelihood that um, a, an adolescent would try marijuana before or after alcohol. And what you can see here, if you look at this blue, the kind of turquoise colored line on the bottom, you can see that over time, this, um, this line is coming up a bit. And that's the line for trying marijuana before alcohol. So in over each year, um, there's an increase in the odds of trying alcohol after marijuana compared to before marijuana, showing that marijuana is increasingly um, the first substance tried. This is a similar graph for cigarettes. You can see the line is much, um, is sort of more steeply sloped, um, showing that marijuana is increasingly tried before cigarettes as well. So why does this matter? Why do we care about marijuana use in young people? Um, first is the impact on health, and these are some of the health effects that are noted in the 2017 National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report. Um, the one thing I just wanted to highlight is some emerging data on the relationship between cannabis use and suicidality that just came out a couple months ago. Uh, this is from uh, the journal JAMA Network Open, and this is a paper that was led by uh, sort of leadership in the National Institutes on, on Drug Abuse. Um, and what you can see here is this is sort of partitioning out how cannabis use, cannabis use disorder, major depressive episodes, that's what MDE is here, and suicidal ideation are related. And what we can see across all of these bars is that um, for cannabis use disorder, for example, on the left here, um, with or without a major depressive episode is associated with suicidal ideation. So cannabis use disorder uh, associated with suicidal ideation, additionally daily and non-daily use associated with greater um, suicidal ideation. And then secondly is thinking of how, in addition to health, how um, marijuana use may impact the development of substance use disorder. So just use generally translating into an actual use disorder. Um, and so this is data again from uh, leadership at the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. This again came out just a few months ago, um, looking at the proportion of lifetime cannabis users who were aged 12 to 25 and the proportion of them that had uh, reported a cannabis use disorder diagnosis in the past year. And what you can see here is that overall, 15% um, of uh, lifetime adolescent cannabis use disorders report past year cannabis use disorder. 
um, and 10% of lifetime adult, uh, young adult cannabis users report tw past 12 month cannabis use disorder. The longer the time since their initiation as these numbers go out to the right, the higher that proportion. So this is a significant concern that we are that we are likely to see some change in cannabis use disorder with increased uh, trial and use. And then third is again this relationship between substances. So the impact of marijuana use on trial or use of other substances. In youth, we know that this relationship is generally bidirectional. Young people who try one product are more likely to try another. Um, in adults, we see that cannabis use is associated with increased initiation, persistence, and relapse to cigarette smoking. And in adolescents and young adults, we also know that cannabis use is associated with alcohol dependence and alcohol-associated adverse effects. Um, and this is a, a study from a few years ago looking at the ways in which using these products together, specifically cannabis and tobacco, um, can be related to heavier use and poorer functioning. So one of the things I want to highlight here is that substance use does not exist in a vacuum. Um, so all of these substances are being used together as we are thinking about cannabis prevention policies and intervention opportunities. We need to be thinking about how that affects the entire ecosystem of substance use, including tobacco and alcohol. Um, this is a paper that, uh, that we did a few years ago using data from a large national sample called the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health where we looked at patterns in substance use. And I apologize um, that the, the uh, animation didn't work here for you to see the, the patterns. But the thing that I wanted to highlight here is that if you look through this list of the top patterns of substance use, um, what you can see here is that there is no marijuana only uh, group. Um, there's alcohol and marijuana, there's alcohol cigarettes and marijuana, there's alcohol cigarettes, marijuana and cigars in these top 10 patterns, but not a marijuana only group. So again, just keeping that context and keeping awareness of that context of poly substance use. So how does Vermont compare to the United States? Um, in terms of past month use, these are data for adolescents. And what you can see here is uh, Vermont in the blue lines compared to the US um, in the red lines. And for each of the substances, tobacco, past month tobacco, past month alcohol, past month marijuana use, we are higher than the US estimates overall. Um, so that's a consistent pattern in our adolescents. Similarly, in young adults, we have higher past month uh, prevalence of tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana use in Vermont compared to the US. So we're starting off in a different place um, than, than other states that have, uh, that have legalized cannabis sales. Similarly, for harm perceptions, we see that on the left, we're looking at the perceived harm, a, a great perceiving great risk from smoking one or more packs of cigarettes per day. And you can see that Vermont and the US look very similar. When we look at the prevalence of great risk from binge drinking once or twice a week, you can see that Vermonters are actually the lower line here meaning that we have lower harm perceptions of binge drinking or of smoking marijuana once a month in adolescence compared to the US. So we have higher use, we have lower harm perceptions. We see this pattern um, consistently in our adolescents and again in our young adults. Why does that matter? Um, well, we have some strong data in the tobacco literature that lower harm perceptions of a product predict subsequent tobacco product use, so that there is a relationship between having low harm perceptions of a product 
and initiating or trying that product. We know in cross-sectional studies that greater perceived risk of marijuana, so having higher harm perceptions of marijuana, is actually protective. So sim same relationship, um, higher harm perceptions means lower use in youth. But again, as I mentioned, when we're thinking of other states that have permitted cannabis sales, what you can see here is the date that it was passed, the opening date of the first retailers, and then national data from, again, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health that I pulled from right before that policy went into place and then right after that policy went into place. So this is a short-term look. Um, but the thing I really want to highlight here is our state is starting out um, with a much higher prevalence of young adult uh, past month marijuana use. So you can see we're at almost 40% even pre-policy. Uh, pre um, none of the states, even in their post-implementation period, have reached that level of past 30-day use, past month use. So this is an important context for us to have in thinking about um, whether we have, you know, have we reached a ceiling where we're, we, you know, we may not see more uptake or is this going to dramatically change when we may see um, even, even higher levels here? With respect to what's happened in other states uh, that have legalized cannabis sales, uh, Washington state saw a decrease in perceived harm of marijuana and an increase in frequent marijuana use in adolescents post-legalization. In Colorado, um, they documented no effect on perceived harm or marijuana use in adolescents, but again, as, um, as James noted, the perceived ease of access to marijuana increased in adolescents. And then in Oregon, um, the data that I have here for is for undergraduates, college students, young adults. Um, they saw an increase in past 30-day marijuana prevalence um, and a decrease in past 30-day tobacco use. Um, and that didn't differ by age, whether they were under or above the age cutoff for legal sales. National data on evaluations of recreational marijuana legalization are fairly limited. Um, but the, uh, the couple that exist, one of them, uh, again, used the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, looked at everyone ages 12 and above, and documented a small increase in past year cannabis use disorder in adolescents um, as a result in, in states where um, recreational marijuana had been legalized. They saw no impact on young adults. Um, and they saw an increase in frequent marijuana use and in cannabis use disorder in adults age 26 plus. So again, cannabis use disorder um, showing up increases in adolescents and in those age eight, uh, 26 plus. Uh, data on college students um, using a national survey of college health showed that uh, states with recreational marijuana legalization had increased past 30-day marijuana use prevalence. Um, they saw that in particular subgroups, including females, students who were living off campus, and those aged 21 plus. And in another study, um, they, sh they found that the relationship between uh, recreational marijuana legalization and other substance use, so they were looking at tobacco, alcohol, um, prescription drug use, et cetera, they found decreased binge drinking um, in the states that had uh, legalized recreational marijuana in those age 21 plus, and, but they also saw increased sedative misuse in younger, um, younger participants. So a lot of the work that I do at um, uh, currently is with the PACE Vermont study, and PACE stands for Policy and Communication Evaluation. Um, this is a study that is a partnership. Um, it was initially funded by the Vermont Department of Health and with uh, a grant from uh, pilot funds from the UVM Cancer Center, and it has now been funded by the National Institutes on Health 
Um, the goal of our study is to understand the impact of state level policies and communication campaigns on substance use beliefs and behaviors in young Vermonters. So our study spans ages 12 to 25. We conduct online surveys of young people uh, almost quarterly and we uh, are able to be really flexible with our instrument and we work together. I work very closely with the Department of Health on um, the items that we include so that we can make sure that we are tracking uh, and also evaluating some of the state efforts that are in place and coming into place. I want to give you a bit of um, background on how I how we think of how all these things relate um, and how we structure our data collection. So uh, in terms of that relationship between harm perceptions and use, we think that policy has an impact on harm perceptions. Um, it also likely has an impact directly on behavior. Um, as that relates to access and many other, many other facets um, of, of actual behavior. Communication efforts linked with policy also have an impact on harm perceptions. And again, from harm perceptions, we think that this is where we're changing norms, attitudes, um, and behavioral control or decisions about um, cost benefit of using a substance those things then um, relate to intention to use and then ultimately use. So when we're thinking about harm perceptions, we're thinking of that as a marker for a pathway that leads to potential curiosity or intention to use and ultimately use. Uh, as I mentioned, we're able to track things in fairly real time. So we launched the Pace Vermont study in the spring of 2019. Um, it was about a year after the um, possession policy came into effect. So we had a number of items related to policy awareness um, and just being able to look at how policy awareness differed within our sample. We have an opportunity at this point to be able to look forward and prospectively evaluate um, how policy, how um, the recreational policy may impact beliefs and use. But um, we've also taken advantage of the timing of our studies to evaluate um, the potential impact of the e-cigarette excise tax, the ban on online cigarette e-cigarette sales, um, tobacco 21 that came in in the fall of 2019. Uh, and then we had the COVID pandemic and we have data um, essentially spanning a year between um, pre-COVID and post-COVID. So we have uh, the, the numbers that are um, filled in solid orange here, we have collected. We are currently in the field with wave seven um, and we have uh, one week left on that, so we'll be closing that out soon. And then we have funding to complete two more waves of data collection in the fall and winter of this year. One of the um, things that we've been really happy to see is that our sample looks pretty close to state estimates from national surveillance tools. So this is these are comparisons. The orange dots are Pace Vermont. The uh, kind of darker red dots are from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health estimates for our state for a similar time frame. And what you can see here is these dots are very close to each other for cigarette use, alcohol, marijuana use in both teens and in young adults. And that just gives us greater um, comfort in making statements and, and drawing conclusions about um, the way that our policies and communication efforts might be impacting uh, Vermont uh, teens and young adults because our data look fairly similar to the national surveillance systems that are in place. So one of the things that we asked about in our first wave of the Pace Vermont study, which was in 2019, was um, among young adults, what their beliefs were about marijuana. And what you can see here is oh, the great risk um, from weekly marijuana use. Um, that's sort of similar to what we see in the national data for the great risk perceived harm of monthly marijuana use. It's about 8%. It's, uh, I think, a little tiny bit lower in the national sample. 
um, but that's for weekly versus monthly use. So we're, we're on track there, we're on par. You can see here that there's a large proportion of the sample that believes there's uh, a slight risk or no risk um, from weekly marijuana use. Um, and then we included items that were, uh, you, that were um, being targeted in potential campaigns. Uh, regular marijuana use during early years of life can negatively affect attention. Approximately one in 16 who start using marijuana before age 14 develop addiction. Teens who use marijuana have lower academic performance and worse job prospects. Teens who use marijuana weekly or more have twice the risk of depression. And then we also asked a question about what substance in marijuana makes a person high, um, just with the understanding that there was, um, uh, that CBD was becoming uh, much more prevalent in the market. Um, and uh, so we have the data here, you can see the majority um, of, of young adults reporting 80% that regular marijuana use can negatively affect attention, about half um, agreeing with the addiction statement, approximately one in six teens um, who use before age of 14 develop addiction, less than half um, reporting agreement with lower academic performance and worse job prospects, about 60% reporting um, the relation agreement with the statement about uh, weekly marijuana use being associated with depression. <clears throat> Additionally, we asked um, sort of relative uh, perceived addictiveness of substances. We asked about nicotine, caffeine, alcohol, marijuana, cigarettes, electronic vapor products, and heroin. And we asked people to rate these on a scale from not at all addictive to extremely addictive. Um, the, what we did with this, and this is work that um, my doctoral student, Julia West, has been leading. Um, we looked at how those beliefs cluster together. Um, so we used a, an analytic technique called latent class modeling to really put people together who responded similarly. And what we found is that there were kind of four big groups of young adults, uh, youth and young adults. There was about 30% of the sample who reported that everything, all of these substances were highly addictive. So across the board, they generally reported that everything was highly addictive. We then had a class that was largely defined by reporting that alcohol was moderately addictive and that marijuana ha was, had low addictiveness. And that was the bulk of our sample. So that was 60% of our sample reporting um, low perceived addictiveness of marijuana. Uh, then we had a group that was sort of a bit more mixed and we had a group that generally rated everything as uh, low perceived addictiveness. What was interesting to us is that um, older, as you got older, you were more likely to move from that high perceived addictiveness class to the group that had the low perceived addictiveness of marijuana. So as people aged, as they got to about age 18, like 17 to 18, there was a real switch and uh, there was a higher proportion of people in that low perceived addictiveness of marijuana group. Um, the, the low perceived uh, addictiveness of marijuana group, this class two also had higher ever electronic vapor product use, marijuana use and alcohol use than the high than the high perceived addictiveness group. And they also had higher past 30 day tobacco, marijuana and alcohol use than the class one. So again, this is another way of us getting at that relationship between harm perceptions and use to understand how we might target um, communication efforts. In work that I had done um, in a national sample of young adults several years ago, as we were seeing um, cannabis uh, uh, legalization rolling out across the country, we added some items in about support for legalization efforts and predictors of uh, intentions to use um, these products. Um, So uh, what we saw was that about 40% of our national sample of young adults favored legalizing marijuana and 
14% indicated that if it were legalized, they would use it more frequently. So this, again, as I mentioned, we were coming into the field about a year after um, the state marijuana policy had changed. So we asked uh, all of our participants to report um, which of the following best describe Vermont's new mar marijuana law, and we asked them to select all that apply. And we um, identified correct responses as those who reported it was legal for people to 21 plus to use, that it was allowed for medical use, that they may own up to two plants, but not that it was legal, it was incorrect if they said that it was legal for anyone to use, that they could use in public, or that it was legal to sell. And what we saw was that about 60% of young adults in Vermont could correctly describe the policy that was in place. Um, that still leaves about 40% who could not correctly describe the policy in place. Um, probably not surprisingly, those who had ever or who had used marijuana ever or in the past 30 days were more likely to have um, correct knowledge of the policy. Um, but younger, non-white, and less educated participants were less likely to have correct knowledge about the policy. So for us, that highlighted that there may be some groups that we need to target intervention, prevention efforts toward um, to make sure that everyone understands equally uh, the policy in place and, and the implications of the policy. Additionally, we did see some relationships between policy knowledge, knowledge awareness of the state policy and some of these harm perceptions. So um, people who reported that um, the perceived harm was of uh, weekly marijuana use, that there was a, only a slight risk um, compared to no risk, those folks were more likely to report um, correct knowledge of the policy those who reported agreement or don't know with the marijuana and attention item, more likely to have correct knowledge, um, and, and a couple of other relationships here. Uh, those who could correctly identify what substance in marijuana um, makes a person high, again, more likely to uh, report correct aware, uh, report awareness of the policy. We also track behavior over time, and you can see this is um, over a six-month period. The graph on the left is the prevalence of electronic vapor product use or vaping e-cigarettes, um, generally with nicotine, and, and this is on the right, the prevalence of marijuana use by age group. Um, this is particularly interesting to us uh, to track over time because uh, between summer and fall, was the time during which e-cigarette and vaping associated lung injury epidemic was taking place. You may remember Evali. Um, it was initially attributed to um, vaping products and later was, was uh, largely attributed to vitamin E acetate in, um, in uh, informally obtained marijuana uh, vaping products. So we're just sort of interested to track whether that had any impact on use over time. And what you can see here is the bars represent every use, um, the red in youth and the orange in young adults, and the lines represent past 30 day use. And really what you see here is the past 30 day use is pretty flat um, for both of our age groups. So we didn't really see much change over this six month period. But what I do want to highlight is that even in a short six month period, we're seeing quite a bit of initiation. Um, so in our youth, um, electronic vapor product use, we see about 5% um, initiation uh, over a six month period. We see almost 9% um, in our young adults. Similarly for marijuana use, we see about a 5% um, initiation over a six month period in youth and about 4% initiation of marijuana use in, um, in young adults. This is data that really, th these are data that really aren't currently available in, in any other place. Um, most of what we have is some sort of retrospective recall. This is actually being able to follow people forward and track their change in behavior over a short term period. We also asked um, in, at, 
as uh, we're interested in the valley about um, last time you vaped, what was in the mist you inhaled? Um, and interestingly, you can see here that the, the proportion reporting that they last vaped nicotine um, sort of decreased a little bit, but the proportion reporting that they had vaped marijuana or hash oil increased. We also asked um, among past 30 day users whether they had quit or cut down in the past year. Um, and what we saw was that a much higher proportion of electronic vapor product users tried to quit or cut down compared to marijuana users. So there's a fairly small percentage of marijuana users who had tried to quit or cut down. Um, and the reasons that they endorsed um, those who were trying to quit or cut down on vaping nicotine had a high proportion of them reported health, uh, money or cost, 61%, 41% reporting freedom from addiction. What you can see here is that the top three reasons for quitting or cutting down on marijuana, it, there was not, a, there was not a, a pattern here that was as decisive as the vaping nicotine pattern. So kind of a third, a third, a third, um, saying other was, their top, was the top reason endorsed money or cost and health was kind of down on the list. Only 25% of people highlighting health as a reason for quitting or cutting down on marijuana. So again, as I mentioned, we had um, our three waves of data collected in 2019 and then about a year break until we got data in 2020. And so that, that this is essentially a period that is a one year period straddling um, COVID in the middle. And so what you can see here is tracking past 30 day substance use, we're seeing it's, it's generally remained flat. Um, but we did ask specifically among, um, among youth and young adults who had used uh, a substance in the past 30 day, how their substance use had changed since the start of COVID. And generally we saw a pattern where you know, about 40% stayed the same, um, about, and then like 15% to 30, 34% decreased, and then a proportion increased. And the thing that was interesting to me is that marijuana use was the one that really stuck out here as the substance that had increased um, in past 30 day users during COVID. We also asked, this is data that we just collected this spring. Um, uh, again, kind of updating our harm perceptions um, on uh, related to weekly marijuana use. And if you kind of squint your eyes, um, what you can see is that the red bars, which are the youth, generally have higher harm perceptions, which is what we would hope to see. That's what, that's what we know is protective um, against use the young adults generally have much lower harm perceptions of marijuana use. We asked a different series of marijuana beliefs in spring of 2021. Um, and this is again, data just from, that we collected in April of this year, um, showing that there's a high proportion of uh, youth and young adults who agree or strongly agree with uh, marijuana can be addictive, Marijuana use affects a person's timing, movement, and coordination, which can harm athletic performance. Marijuana use can affect mental health, including depression and anxiety. Marijuana use can affect performance in school or at work. And driving while high on marijuana can result in slower reaction times, lane weaving, and lack of coordination. Um, interestingly, the the item that they did not endorse very strongly was most studies on the relationship between marijuana and health were done when THC levels in marijuana were much lower. The majority of participants here responded don't know. So in terms of, again, just contextualizing, so we have this really high percentage of young people reporting, um, you know, beliefs that are consistent with the, you know, understanding the potential health harms um, or impact on cognitive uh, or performance uh, that marijuana may have. Um, but again, we still see 
um, this higher proportion of use in adolescents and young adults. So there, there is some sort of disconnect that we're going to have to bridge to reduce use in young people. So what works to prevent substance use in young people? We have a lot of evidence from the tobacco world. This is information from the Community Guide to Preventive Services. What you can see here is comprehensive tobacco control programs, smoke-free policies, interventions to increase the unit price for tobacco products, mass reach health communication interventions. All of these um, re reduce initiation of tobacco use and are recommended. What comprehensive tobacco control looks like is a, a coordinated effort with a central administration and management, state and community level interventions, health communication interventions, cessation interventions, and surveillance and evaluation that's always monitoring the progress and able to be uh, responsive and make tweaks to those programs. One of the things I wanted to highlight here is just e-cigarette laws that have come into place. Um, in Vermont, I think a lot of this mirrors some of what will be present for um, cannabis sales, um, prohibiting use in work sites, restaurants, and bars. We call that smoke-free policy. Um, requiring a retail license to sell e-cigarettes over the counter. Uh, banning self-service displays or vending machines of the products. Uh, restricting sales. Um, to those age 21 plus and having a tax on the product. So all, all of these things in place for e-cigarettes, I, I, as I understand it, these things will be in place for cannabis as well. We do have effective national tobacco prevention campaigns. These are two examples, the Truth Campaign and FDA's Real Cost Campaign. These are recent ads. And in Vermont, we have a, a successful e-cigarette prevention campaign, which we've actually been evaluating using the PACE data. For alcohol, there are also a list of uh, uh, preventive services that are recommended. And I wanted to just highlight these because some of these seem to be more related to sales, um, taxes, et cetera, though there is one here related to screening and brief intervention to reduce um, excessive alcohol consumption, and also, again, enhanced enforcement of, of laws that prohibit sales to minors are recommended. For cannabis, there's nothing yet. There's no community guide for cannabis. Um, so that's, that's where we need to start building the evidence base. So if we think about comprehensive cannabis control looking like tobacco control, I want to just take a minute to think about the health communication intervention piece. So in the 2012 Surgeon General's report on preventing tobacco use in youth and young adults, one of their major conclusions was that advertising and promotional activities by tobacco companies have been shown to cause the onset and continuation of smoking among adolescents and young adults. And I highlight this because there is a really strong language and evidence synthesis process for these reports that they don't use the word cause unless there's a lot of evidence to back it up. They use the word cause with all of these diseases that are caused by cigarette smoking. So I just wanted to make that connection um, as we think about the ways in which there's really nascent data on cannabis marketing and youth use, because there hasn't been a retail market um, until you know a decade ago or so. So we have a couple of studies that are showing that um, youth living in states with legalized retail cannabis, um, that things that we know are associated in our tobacco literature, liking or following a business on social media, owning or wearing cannabis branded merchandise, having a favorite, favorite brand, those are associated with use. Um, seeing billboards are correlated with uh, uh, cannabis use disorder, 
um, seeing billboards, owning or li being likely to own branded merchandise, having a favorite brand, again, associated with weekly cannabis use among, um, among youth. So similar, similar um, patterns that we see in tobacco, but again, the, this is new evidence that's emerging at this point. I just also want to highlight that marketing comes in many forms. So we may be thinking about what's happening at the point of sale or what's going to show up in magazine advertisements or in um, seven days or somewhere else. Um, but we are seeing a, a tremendous growth in um, consulting for social media marketing of cannabis companies. You can see here, these are products that were featured in a recent New York Times article that are um, uh, packaging that looks a lot like candy packaging for cannabis products. This is uh, a billboard from um, Weed Maps on legalized cannabis. And then on the bottom right is the use of influencers on social media to promote cannabis. So there are many ways in which marketing occurs. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just highlight was that for cigarette marketing expenditures, the bulk of those happen at the point of sale with price discounts. So we think of all these things being related to marketing and we would likely think magazine art advertising, mail advertising, outdoor advertising, those are really a small proportion of the tobacco um, marketing expenditures. The bulk of it is in price discounts. So that's something we may wanna keep our eye on. And just again, $7.6 billion in 2019 spent on cigarette marketing alone. All of these things work together, product design, packaging and labeling, marketing, social acceptability, the sensory experience, they all occur from the product level to the society and they're all inextricably linked. It's really hard to identify each piece, they all play together. Um, but one of the things I wanted to highlight was this idea of health claims on a product or labeling and, and its relationship to lower harm perceptions. So these are a couple of images I pulled um, from the internet. One is a product, and I don't know if that you can read it, but it says uncut, additive-free, native cannabinoid and terpene ratios, whole plant derived. And then you can see here the organic product label. Um, this is similar to, uh, these are tobacco cigarette ads from this year. Um, you can see plant-based menthol. You can see this relationship to growth and growing and uh, organic tobacco. Um, my colleague, Jenny Pearson, who'll be presenting later today, we've collaborated on a number of studies that document that these kind of claims, organic, natural, additive-free, um, they, they result in misperceptions of harm of the product. In terms of cannabis counter-marketing, um, I came across an FTC-driven campaign called Operation CBD, CB Deceit um, about the um, health claims related to CBD. Um, there, as far as I know, is no national um, cannabis counter-marketing effort in place. Now, what happened in the National Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign in the 90s um, was actually that they found that exposure to the ads for that campaign resulted in pro-marijuana cognitions and greater initiation of use. We call that a boomerang effect. So it had the opposite of the intended effect. It actually increased use in young people. I think as a result of that, very few states have launched mass media public education campaigns that accompany their cannabis sales policies. To date, none of them have published any outcome evaluation data. Um, Colorado had an initial um, counter-marketing effort called Don't Be a Lab Rat that was sort of pulled. Um, they have uh, another one in place, but as far as I could tell, there, there are no evaluation data available to look at the impact. A couple of the studies that I've been involved with on anti-marijuana messaging uh, looked at print campaigns. Uh, one called Do the Math and the other called Spread the Facts. Um, we compared 
three different topics within these messaging campaigns that were similar across. So we had uh, messages on cognitive performance, messages on driving, and messages on health harms. And we did kind of two parallel studies, one that just looked at um, self-reported response to the messages, and then one that brought people into the lab, exposed them to the messages, and tracked their eye tracking, their heart rate, their skin conductance as a way to understand um, or better capture potentially their response to the messages. So in these two studies, um, in this self-report study, we saw that, that message liking and perceived harm um, were associated with effectiveness of the message, perceived effectiveness of the messages, um, and that these the messages that had greater uh, negative affect and lower positive affect, something that like a fear appeal that would um, raise concerns about health, um, those were those were correlated with higher perceived effectiveness of the message. In the lab study, we used heart rate, again, skin conductance, facial action coding, and their self-reported measures. We found that the driving themed messages um, were sort of the most effective. Uh, had people um, had the greatest uh, sort of resource allocation, were uh, paying attention, and uh, most positive emotional response to those messages. Vermont has a number of programs in place right now. Um, Outlast, Parent Up, I believe they're launching Let's Talk Cannabis. Uh, we are working to collect data on these at in many waves of our Pace Vermont study, tracking awareness, exposure, liking, and potential impact on behavior. Um, this is an opportunity for us to evaluate the impact and inform future efforts for the state. So where do we go next? First, I just want to highlight that the status quo for prevention and cessation is that these remain largely uh, grouped by age. So we have prevention interventions that address adolescents, and then we have cessation interventions that address adults who are potentially already regular users. Our young adults really fall through the cracks. We don't have good programs in place to support them on either side. So why does that matter? Um, well, young adulthood is the period during which people attain the legal age to vote. They marry, buy tobacco products, and again, alcohol and cannabis products, potentially. Um, they move um, from high school to college or work. They move potentially out of their parents' home. This is the developmental period where adult health behaviors are established. So if we're thinking about now we have consistency across tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis where there is an age cutoff at 21, we really need to age up our prevention efforts to cover that full 12 to 20 at least age group, if not range through the full age group of young adults to be most effective. Um, and then the other piece is thinking about how we address cessation and how we offer treatment opportunities to adults or even to youth who want to reduce or, or quit. So in summary, we need to address adolescents and young adults in our prevention work. Um, we can't just limit it to youth. We also need to think about how our prevention strategies may have impacts on quitting or cutting down on marijuana use. That's what we see in tobacco use. Um, the interventions that impact initiation also impact cessation. We need to create linkages. So our public health, our public education, our health communication, our point of sale messaging, we need to have the health resources listed. So treatment resources or other information listed and available for a potentially larger pool of people. And we also need to think about what comprehensive cannabis control looks like. Um, how do we develop and coordinate novel surveillance treatment and prevention efforts and ensure that marketing does not induce misperceptions. I also just want to um, think a little bit about how does prevention, what are we talking about with prevention? And some of the work that I've been doing has been about how we could even think about this period between experimentation and progression to regular use 
as trying to prevent the escalation of use, not just losing people if they try a product, um, which is sort of how we think of prevention now, but how can we address um, use over the life course to have a better, uh, greater impact on public health. So we continue to have challenges with addressing co-use of substances. We need to increase reach and efficacy of our prevention interventions into young adulthood. We also need to improve reach efficacy and uptake of treatment interventions in young people. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to answer any questions. Thank, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we're very fortunate to have you with us. Are there any questions for Dr. Valenti? Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, um, one of the slides you showed talked about um, the like the perception of harm, and I think it went from 18 to 25. And I'm wondering if we know the difference or the perception of harm over time. So between 18 and 21 and 21 plus, if that changes at that you know time where someone is is now legal to use or legal to purchase. That's a great question. So the the major, as I've mentioned multiple times, the major data source for that is um, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and really the the way that they report is in those bigger buckets. There, um, I think you have to get access to a restricted data file to look at that difference by year of age. That's something um, certainly we could try to look at. Um, and we could look at that in our case data as well and just see if there is a jump. Generally, we do see um, a change in use between age 17 and 18. Um, and so that, that would be a great, a great um, thing to look at is whether the harm perceptions have a jump at that point as well. Thank you. And my other question is, um, you talked a little bit about the type of information that should be available, and we'll be working with the Department of Health on a, um, you know, on a, a, a labeling uh, for that. And I'm wondering what you would suggest and what other information should be available when someone purchases, um, particularly if they're bringing it home to a, a, a home that has use in it. Yeah, I think that there's, you know, we've we've dealt with this largely for um, uh, e-cigarettes with the potential uh, poisoning concerns for, for youth and making sure that the products are um, child safe and packaging and, and all of those aspects of it. Um, warning labels is something that I think we will need to do some testing on to see what are the messages that resonate um, and uh, uh, that that's been a struggle in the tobacco world where we've had really small, small warning labels on the product for decades. And we're just now getting to a point where we can have uh, larger text-based warnings or even graphic warnings. So that's something I think we, we need more research on, but um, generally having a graphic warning label uh, is the best case scenario. Um, Dr. Valenti, uh, just following up on that exact question, um, have you seen how effective um, the kind of the large, like 50% of the packaging and the graphic labeling has been in other countries that allow that? Yes. So the 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 sort of gradation is uh, the littlest label is the least effective. As you have a larger text only label, you have more impact on um, you know uh, on cessation and reducing use of the product. And then as you add the graphic warning label, that becomes even more effective. So worst case scenario is a little tiny label. Best case scenario is a graphic warning label. Dr. Valenti, thank you so much for being here. Your, your presentation was, was very insightful. Question, and this was something that was kind of uh, touched or teased upon throughout your presentation, and I recognize this might be outside of your scope or your research because this was about cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco, but I am curious about the correlation with opioid use. I know we have an op opioid issue in Vermont and around the country, so I'm, I'm interested in you know, real or perceived harm, real or perceived access, and the correlation in cannabis or in jurisdictions that have a legal regulated cannabis market and how you think about opioids, you know, again, whether that's perceived harm, real harm, perceived access, real access. Um, and if you, you don't, if that's not in your wheelhouse, um, I would love to 
to be steered in some directions uh, from you, whether that's data or, or other folks that we can speak to. So I've only seen one study that has addressed um, the impact, sort of the, what, what I would describe as sort of a substitution effect. How does uh, the presence of recreational cannabis impact um, substitution of other products? And that, that study showed reduces, uh, reductions in binge drinking, um, increases in sedative use, no impact on opioid use. I did come across some weed maps billboards, though, that are going up talking about the relationship between um, uh, recreational cannabis being in place and lower uh, opioid use. I'm not sure whether we have much data on that. I can certainly look into you, to it and see if there's anything more and get back to you. Um, but I don't know that we we know that these you know substances are poly substance use is a dominant pattern. So people who are using one substance are using another. Um, I don't know that these are directly substitutable for each other. Great, certainly understand and appreciate that. Um, thank you, and unfortunately we can't have billboards here. Right, right, right. Um, one more question, you, you highlighted that kind of, that gap in young adulthood and how you know, folks moving out of their parents' house, so on and so forth, kind of get you know, slipped through the cracks when it comes to a lot of you know, these types of resources and, and conversations. What what do you think, and I know we, Pepper, or Chairman Pepper and, and Julie um, touched upon packaging and labeling, but, but what can the board do from an educational perspective to help that specific group of people that I guess 18 to 21 group make an informed decision recognizing that you know, they shouldn't be using this product legally until they are at the age of 21. So the, what we've seen in the tobacco world is that as we make our campaigns more appealing to an older group, so older adolescents and young adults, it remains effective for youth. So I think some of this is retargeting our, our educational efforts to, to resonate with that age group, doing focus groups with that age group, developing content to target uh, you know, what's coming up and what is salient to our young adult group um, with the expectation and obviously continuing to do that work in youth as well, but understanding that generally youth are looking up to young adults that, and those messages become sort of aspirational for them. Um, so we're likely to have uh, an impact across that whole age group. That is actually what the Truth Campaign did several years ago when it relaunched, was it aged up its targeting uh, to go 15 to 21 rather than 12 to 17, and they've been effective there. Yeah, and I would imagine, you know, there's been a legal market for, I guess, approximately a decade in other jurisdictions and, and youth that are in that kind of Put, uh, falling through the crack age group were the ones that, you know, were 12 years old, 10 years old when this started to happen. So I think it'll be interesting how that evolves over yeah. time. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's, that's, it's yeah. I, I've just got one quick question for you. I'm so thrilled to see that Pace Vermont exists. Um, you know, one of the recommendations from Colorado when we, as a state, first started thinking about tax and regulate is you need to collect your baseline data right now. Um, you know, you can't wait until after there's retail sales. Uh, so I'm thrilled about that. Um, I'm curious um, how effective, and maybe it's too soon, has the e-cigarette excise tax been on um, either usage or sales? Have you have you seen any results from that that you can share? So it's it's a little hard for us to tell because. Uh, those policies, so there was the tax, the ban on online sales, and then Tobacco 21 came into effect within three months of each other. So it's it's hard to sort of disaggregate um, where the effect was. But we, what we did see was that between the summer and the fall, um, so the summer is when the tax and online sales came into play, and then the fall was when Tobacco 21 came in, we saw that um, ease of access to tobacco products went down in youth, um, which is what we would have hoped to see and what we saw even in that short three month period. So I think we may see these impacts on access to use 
Um, I don't know that we have enough granularity. I don't think we have, you know, everything happens quickly together. So I don't think we can parse which policy had which effect. Right. Well, just, um, I mean, I've got a number of questions here. We're running a little short on time. Do you, is it all right with you if we post your slides to our website? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Thank Great. Thank you. And, um, you know, we're just, I feel very fortunate that we have you here in Vermont and that with the cannabis board and, you know, I know you're probably a very busy person, but, you know, our, uh, Department of Health has a lot to take on in this with this change, and I hope that we could look to you as we as we kind of chart a path forward. Absolutely, happy to be here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. So our next witnesses today are um, are they going to present together? Do you think they're from Prevention and Work Vermont? Yes. I'm trying to get them set up. Right I think now. that Cindy is the lead presenter, but I think um, Cindy, Jessica, and Kate could all turn on their cameras at the same time. Yeah, I just made you all presenters, so you should um, you should have presenting ability. Well, great. Th thank you all so much for joining us. Um, you know, if uh, I, I would leave it to you, I guess, Cindy, to kind of manage uh, how you want to present to us. Um, and um, I think we have about an hour scheduled. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Cindy, I think you're muted. Thank you for having us. Um, Jessica is going to start us off and um, is going to share our PowerPoint. Can everyone see our slides? We can. Yes, we can. Awesome. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Jessica Summer. I am the Operations Director for Prevention Works Vermont, and I'm also the Executive Director for the Milton Community Youth Coalition. Um, I have more than 15 years experience working with youth between schools and public library settings and prevention work. Um, and I have six years of prevention experience here in Vermont um, and I've, most of that has been with youth, and I'm now the executive director of a community coalition up in Milton, serving Chittenden County. Um, Cindy Hayford is the director of the Deerfield Valley Community Partnership in the Wilmington, um, Whittingham area. She has more than 40 years of experience working with youth, 16 as a teacher, and 24 leading a community coalition focused on preventing youth substance misuse and promoting healthy communities. And Kate Nugent, is the executive director for the Winooski Partnership for Prevention. And she has more than 20 years experience as an educator and in nonprofit management and leadership, and more than 12 years now as the executive director of the Winooski Partnership for Prevention. So thank you very much for having us. Thought we'd start this morning with an introduction to who is Prevention Works Vermont and what do we do? Um, so Prevention Works Vermont is a network of community coalition leaders, prevention consultants, service providers, and individuals from across the state. We collaborate with local substance misuse coalitions across the state, as well as other community organizations that share a common goal of supporting healthy living for all Vermonters. Prevention Works Vermont partners help shape how substance misuse prevention is valued in our state. Our mission is to unify voices and be a guiding force on policy, practice, and attitudes that promote substance misuse prevention, health, and wellness in Vermont. And our vision is a strong, sustainable, and unified system to prevent substance misuse. Basically, it's a long way of saying that we're a coalition of coalitions and we all work together and we have, we're made up of leaders from across the state. So we are experts in the work that we do and we're here to help you. All right, Cindy. So it made sense for us to start off with uh, the de kind of the definition of youth substance abuse prevention. And we're going to start off with what is primary prevention. And it really focuses on delaying the onset of any drug use, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, or marijuana, which are the most commonly used substances among youth. 
because we know that the teenage brain is still developing and that leads to a, a greater risk of developing addiction. 90% of those who develop a substance use disorder start using drugs before the age of 18. So our goal as families, communities, and the state really should be to postpone substance use as long as possible. Secondary prevention is um, also called early intervention, and it's trying to detect who's at higher risk for um, substance use and early, early initiation. The goal is to intervene before this, the, the use continues and hopefully stop the use. Prevention efforts basically focus on creating an environment that protects adolescents from early substance use. Comprehensive strategies reduce risk factors in the community. And those are things like social norms, the environment, and drug availability. And it's, they're counteracted with protective factors such as education, support, reduced access, and community engagement. So the process that we use in prevention is called the Strategic Prevention Framework. And it starts with an assessment. So we do a community assessment of what, what's happening in our community and then figure out why it's happening. So that when we implement prevention strategies, we're addressing the root causes of what's happening. An example might be if we had really high tobacco use and we find out that youth are accessing tobacco at retail stores, then the strategies would be addressing the retailer and, and educating so that they weren't providing to, to minors. If we found out that the access was coming from the home, we would do, do a similar strategy, but it would be focused on the home versus the retailer. So really important to do an assessment locally so that we're um, addressing the root causes locally. And then from there, we go to capacity. We wanna build capacity. We wanna bring all sectors of the community together to work on prevention because it can't just be the school, can't just be the family, can't just be the community. It has to be a, a concerted comprehensive effort. And then we do planning and we plan for evidence-based strategies that, that um, address those root causes. We implement those strategies and then of course we evaluate. And this is a constant circle. We're constantly evaluating, reassessing, rebuilding capacity. So as um, Dr. Valente talked about risk of harm, we know that perceived risk of harm from marijuana among high school students has been decreasing in Vermont. This is trend data from 2011, and research shows that a perception of harm as it decreases, use increases, which is a concern. Next slide. And normalization of marijuana. What are the community norms around marijuana? Um, it's led to over half of our high school students believing that it's wrong, only half of our high school students believing that it's wrong for them to use marijuana. And as you can see, that's been decreasing over time as well. Past 30 day of use of marijuana among our high school students has pretty much stayed static until the most recent data that we have, which is the 2019 Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And um, we have seen an increase. You know, over trends for substance use in Vermont, for the most part, we've been seeing downward trends, but in marijuana, you know, with alcohol, tobacco, et cetera, but with marijuana, we've been seeing increases. In my own community, for 20 years, we've seen decreases in all substances, but on this past youth risk behavior survey, we saw a 100% increase in marijuana use from 16% to almost a, th almost a third of our youth using marijuana. So when we talk about strategies, we want to make sure that any prevention um, efforts are comprehensive. And that means that we want to use the Vermont prevention model. We want to do all levels. We want to start with the individual. We want to, um, with education, we want to go to relationships, make sure that we're addressing the family. Because if, if things are happening for the individual, and they have good knowledge and attitudes, but they're going to a family or a community or a school, where things are different, 
we're not going to make change. So it really needs to be all the way from the individual all the way up to policies and systems. So prevention strategies. Typically, what, what research shows is we have to do a number of comprehensive strategies. And these are six of them, education, skill building, limiting access, community norms, support and early screening, physical design, and policies. I'd like to do an analogy about, about COVID-19, about the prevention measures that we used across the country. So when we talk about education and skill building, we were educated on the dangers of the disease. We learned techniques to prevent the spread. Education was based on science. We limited access. You know, we limited access to others. We social distanced, we wore masks. We were limiting access to the virus. Community norms, it really became normal for everyone to be wearing masks, to be washing hands, to be following the safety techniques that were recommended. Support and early screening. We recognized what the symptoms of the disease were, we got tested, and we were given support if it was positive testing. Physical design, we found that there were six feet reminders everywhere. When stores opened, there were, there were one-way pathways. We created a design that limited um, our access to the disease. And then of course, policies. Certain businesses were closed, fitness centers were closed, businesses were closed, people were required to wear masks in the store, and it was limited how many could gather. Now, if we go into substance use prevention, we use these similar prevention strategies. For instance, education and skill building. We implement evidence-based education on the dangers of substance use, the disease of addiction. We teach refu refu refusal skills in healthy lifestyles. We offer, we offer parenting programs. We work to limit access. We require, we require retailers to be trained. We have compliance checks. We encourage adults to secure their drugs, alcohol, and marijuana in the home. We have social ordinances. In terms of community norms, we strive for an environment that reduces youth exposure to alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana messages. We host substance-free events for youth and families. Support and early screening. Parents and school staff recognize early signs of use, and we make referrals for support. In terms of physical design, we limit density of outlets. We limit signage. We have smoke-free parks. And then in terms of policies, there's zoning ordinances. You know, something may be um, not be allowed a thousand feet from schools or places that children gather like parks. This is a prime example. Has We've seen a prime example of this in Dr. Valenti's with policies for tobacco, you know, tobacco prevention, and this is the same. So some here, here's a little bit of additional Vermont data just to be aware of that 6% of our Vermont high school students report trying marijuana for the first time before age 13. 40% of our high school students report ever using marijuana. And 62 of our Vermont high school students report that it's sort of easy or very easy for them to get marijuana. And this is all based on the 2019 YRBS, which is the most recent data that we have access to. So I want to talk about funding because you can't put these prevention strategies into practice without funding. And funding in Vermont, the majority of prevention funding um, has been underfunded and most of it has been federal and most of it has been competitive. You know, um, number of, of prevention coalitions for tobacco, um, for substance use has been um, less than it had in the past. Um, the, we're a little concerned about the 30% of the excise tax that is um, listed in the law to go to substance misuse prevention, because we have to ask, how do we ensure that the funds go to substance misuse prevention as intended? Is there a dedicated fund? Not in the law, there isn't. How do we ensure that the funds are allocated based on criteria as to what's evidence-based prevention? Who's going to be making those decisions? Is there a designated agency or department with expertise in evidence-based practices that will manage the money? An example of what happens when there is not a designated fund is Act 82. 
in July, in July, there was a law that this law states that a significant portion of any new revenue generated by taxation of substances at risk of misuse, including cannabis, tobacco, tobacco substitutes, alcohol, and opiates, be directed to fund substance misuse prevention. There was no designated fund or designated management organization or agency. Also in July, Act, 8, Act 28 increased the tax on e-cigarettes. So those of us in the prevention community were expecting that we would see some prevention funding, but that's not what happened. The e-cigarette tax revenue went to general health care instead of going directly to substance misuse. This has been a concern that both the governor, the Substance Misuse Prevention Committee, and Prevention Works um, has expressed. So let's talk about licensing, education, compliance, and enforcement. You know, local prevention um, coalitions and prevention works have worked with the Department of Liquor and Lottery Control over a decade, providing a unified voice and a guiding force on policy, practice, and attitudes that promote substance misuse prevention, health, and wellness in Vermont. And this partnership has led to local coalitions hosting retailer trainings, which then implemented prevention strategies into the trainings that these re that retailers were required to um, participate in, and also co local coalitions have spent time um, recognizing local successful compliance checks and giving additional support to retailers that didn't pass the compliance checks. Our recommendations around licensing, enforcement, and education is that there be point of sale training for store owners and managers as well as store clerks. That is in the law. Curiously, it's the requirement for the licensee is for every three years, but the requirement for the staff is every two years, which we weren't really sure what, what the purpose of that was. We would like to see that there's a two-year requirement for training because things do change over time. Uh, we hope for full relicensing and retraining when a store changes ownership and frequent co compliance checks, just like we, we have for tobacco and, and okay, sometimes for alcohol. But in order for this to be done, there needs to be some resources put behind that. And we really believe that these enforcement efforts should be on the retailers and not on the youth. Next slide, Jess. Is, uh, is this my section, I think, or? <laughs> Cindy, are you all, are you all set? Yep, you're on. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have a, a pretty brief section, but just focusing on one aspect of uh, this community prevention that can have a huge impact on youth perception um, and access. And I have a quote there from Change Lab Solutions, which I think Andrea mentioned too. It's a really great resource, has tons of data um, to support the, um, the evidence behind thinking of licensing. And I know this board is going to be focused on the state. And um, so we wanted to give you some tools that, that can help with that um, aspect of that. Um, and I think you can go to the next slide, just if you can. Um, so these are tools that have been shown to increase health equity, especially when it comes to other substances. Um, and I'm still looking for the article in my notes, but um, in San Francisco, there was a study that showed that having um, policies like this in place help youth who may not come from you know, a family that's very educated on substance use prevention or might not have access to adequate health care on a regular basis. Um, these kinds of policies can really make sure that all youth, no matter what background they come from, are able to grow up um, as healthy as possible with their brains and their bodies. Um, and so specifically, we're hoping that this board will consider strongly limiting the total number of licenses allowed statewide and also the concentration of licenses because both of those have an impact on um, how youth perceive uh, things are normal or um, for them. And 
and um, you know ease of access as well. Um, and so those were the two things. And also to think about a half mile distance, it's like the most commonly walked distance. I know, you know, where we work in Winooski, it's a walking district. So youth walk up and down Main Street every day to go to school, which is so great for their physical health. But they are constantly bombarded with ads that, you know, as adults, we know where this stuff is. Um, it's not really actually geared towards us, but it really impacts them and gives them impressions about what's okay and, um, you know, I mean, we're all familiar with the different types of ways that these things are sold. So um, places to keep in mind, uh, youth centers, schools, daycares, playgrounds, uh, substance use treatment and recovery centers. There's a lot of connection between um, what triggers somebody who's in recovery and also a youth um, libraries, bus stops, uh, things like that. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. You're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. My dog was barking and I muted myself by accident. All right, um, so now we're gonna move into advertising. So um, advertising for adult use substances is often designed to target youth in some of the traditional tricks of the trade in to recruit uh, future users, which are youth, are things like bright colors, hanging advertising low to the ground, and um, discounts or buy one, get one free offers, or two for a dollar, or two for whatever price point. Um, those are all things that are designed to be exciting and engaging to the youth eye and to um, make um, products more attractive to the youth budget. Um, so without um, signage policies in place, you wind up with stores like this one. This is a, a store in Colchester. Um, this is just one of their windows in the door. Um, this particular retailer had more than 17 ads promoting adult use substances visible from the outside. This picture was taken in mid-February of this year. Um, so this is current. Um, and if you look closely, you can see um, the um, $7.58 here that says why pay more with the um, picture of two packs of cigarettes is um, the lower half of the door which is or the window which is eye level of children so um, adults are not being targeted by this ad that's something where children are going to see it much more so than adults and then here again below the midway point of the door you have this um, ad for a jewel um, saying that the starting kit is on sale for $29.99 um, so as you can see from this example, um, to both tobacco and alcohol are really good at marketing um, toward children, even though that's not the, um, the target audience according to the age for selling the substances. Um, but these companies have always been um, advocating for targeting um, young populations. So our hope is that we consider how advertising policy impacts um, youth use. Um, flavors is something that we're we've all been talking about for years now with tobacco, um, less so with alcohol, but it's still um, something that we need to be aware of that um, these companies use flavors to target youth and make things that are appealing. Um, this top row of the images here are um, pictures of um, e-juice that is specifically designed to look like products that children find appealing. So we have um, Drip and Whip that's supposed to look like Ready Whip whipped cream. We have Vanilla, which is supposed to be vanilla wafers. And the Candy King batch is designed to look like Sour Patch Kids. Um, as much as Big Tobacco likes to talk about these products being for adults, these are very clearly targeted to appeal to teenagers and youth users and not so much to the adult market. Um, the bottom two pictures are examples of flavored alcohol that's designed to appeal to um, youth and young adults. We have a glazed donut and rainbow sherbet vodka. Um, other flavors that youth are particularly interested in are mint or menthol, mango, chocolate, other kinds of candy, gummy bears, birthday cake, berries, other fruits, ice cream, cereals. 
So the recommendation here is that we don't allow any flavored additives because these, generally speaking, are specifically to attract youth users and not adults. So this image here is an example of how Canada structures their um, packaging. And this is our recommendation as the gold standard for the best way to structure packaging in a way that is not appealing to youth. So um, we know that the law says that um, cannabis products are required to be sold in childproof packaging and that um, we're not supposed to be targeting people under 21 with packaging, advertising, or what the products themselves are. Um, but the law doesn't really specify what that means. And so these are some of the things that we would like for you to consider. So you see here this package is solid black. Um, there are some that are solid white. Um, where the number one is, there's a graphic warning label in the shape of a stop sign, so even young children can recognize that this is a product that is not for them um, and something that um, is dangerous and something that they should stop and put down if they were to come across it. Um, where you see the number five over here, um, this is the target for the size of the logo, so smaller than the graphic warning. Um, and then you see here the brand name in plain font with no bright colors, nothing to make it appealing. There's no room here for cartoons or other things that um, might appeal to children. Um, here we have the ingredients list. So this says um, what the THC percentage is. It lets you know what the appropriate dosage is. We're recommending that all packages be um, single dose and not multiple doses. And that's particularly something that comes up in talking about edibles. Frequently things like gummy bears or brownies or chocolates are packaged as a chocolate bar or a full brownie or a bag of gummy bears where the appropriate serving size might be say one or two gummy bears or, or an eighth of a brownie or a chocolate bar, um, which makes it easy for um, accidental overdose to not understand what the appropriate dosage is here. And then here we have in larger text in the brand name um, in number four, the warning label. So explaining what the possible effects of THC are and making sure that people know that this is not a product designed for children. Um, we'd also like to talk about advertising policy. So you see here I've listed on the slide a phrase called content neutral advertising. So basically this is the best practice to make sure that policies um, can't be challenged later. So content neutral advertising policy basically states that regardless of what um, the contents of the signs or the advertising are that you would set a percentage of the exterior of your store that could be filled with advertisements or signs and that no more than that percentage would be allowed to hang up. So signs would include, in some cases, the name of the store. Um, if you have an open or closed sign, maybe you hang up the hours of the store, in addition to things like cannabis, tobacco, alcohol, um, Coca-Cola advertisements, et cetera. So the idea there is that you would make sure that you reduce the amount of exposure to advertising so that um, particularly if children are driving past the store or walking past, that they're not seeing as much. Um, this is both important for, for the reducing the impact of advertising on youth as well as increasing safety of people coming in and out of the store. So if you remember the picture I just showed you of the store in Colchester, there were so many things in the window and the door that it was actually very difficult to even see if someone was coming at you at the door. Um, so it's not uncommon to bump into someone because you can't see them when you're coming in and out of the store. Because cannabis is a product that is federally illegal, you can make um, specific requests um, or laws around what you allow for advertising for cannabis without worrying about free speech. Um, but the gold standard for how to best approach that is to go at it from a content neutral advertising perspective instead of just uh, we're not going to allow this particular substance to have um, advertising, but that is an option that's available to you because of its um, federal illegal status. We're also advocating for no discounts or price promotions. Um, again, because those are things that um, reduce the price and make it easier for youth to be able to afford um, products and then to be able to engage in them. Uh, we also wanted to talk about potency. So um, potency has a really important impact on mental health. 
just 15% THC in the flower triples the risk of psychosis in cannabis users, and that increases by five times with daily use. So um, we recognize that the, the law says that um, potency of, of up to 60% THC is allowed in concentrates, and we would like to encourage you to set some rules to reduce that. Um, because that high of a percentage of THC can have really strong negative impacts on the brains of the people who are using, especially in that um, young adult age bracket. So the um, anytime you start using substances when your brain is still developing, so under the age of 25, you increase um, risk of psychosis and you increase risk of developing a substance use disorder. So even in that legal use rate between 21 and 25, um, you're still at risk of damaging your brain by substance use. So lowering potency will lower the permanent risk of brain damage for people in that young adult window. Um, and then just some additional information for you. Um, the pediatric cannabis exposure rates increased by five times in Colorado between 2009 and 2015. So comparing the rates prior to legalization and after in Colorado. And then um, hospitalizations where kids had to be admitted um, triple or sorry, doubled after legalization. So those are some things that are concerning. Um, most of the children who were impacted by accidental exposure um, were children under three. So um, making sure that potency levels are lower and that um, you're packaging things individually reduces the risk of accidental poisoning for children who might get their hands on things that their parents might have purchased. So um, California and Colorado are both exploring reducing their allowed potency in response to the increased risk and the um, increased hospitalization rates that they've seen in children. So our recommendations include reducing the allowed maximum percent THC below the current law, which says 60%. Um, 10 milligrams of THC is uh, considered a standard single serving, um, but we're recommending that um, we also have five as the considered um, starting low dose for first time use. So you can build up some tolerance to substances, which means that those who've never used them before um, or might be in that you know, 21 to 25 age bracket, um, if they're able to purchase something that has high potency and they've never used before, um, they're much more likely to have negative impacts as a result of their use. So if we can reduce and have um, smaller starting doses, um, that can make it safer. Um, and again, um, making sure that we package in single servings um, eliminates accidental over-serving and reduces the risk of poisoning in children. All right, Cindy, it's back to you. So we pretty much already covered this piece, so why don't you go forward? So in summary, um, now that cannabis retail sales are coming to Vermont towns, we hope that as regulations are determined that the impact of our youth and what can be done to protect them will always be considered. We understand that some of these recommendations are not under the purview of the board, but um, we hope that they'll be included in your recommendations to the legislature. So we advocate for a dedicated fund to ensure that the funds go to substance use and not let history repeat itself with the funds going elsewhere. We um, would advocate for an agency such as the Vermont Department of Health to be designated to disperse the prevention funds to ensure that it's allocated to evidence-based prevention practices. We would advocate that cannabis facilities and outlets do be distanced from anywhere that youth gather and that the density of outlets be limited that advertising and signage does not promote marijuana use messages to our young people, that potency limits be considered, and that preventing access of cannabis products to youth through enforcement be focused on retailer training, education, and compliance through an experienced agency, such as the Department of Liquor and Lottery. So we thank you. And um, at this time, if you have any questions, we'd love to take those. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. Are there any questions for Jessica, Cindy, or Katie? Um, I have a question and I think you've touched on this a little bit and I know that I spoke with you, um, some of you about this, but I think it's really important for the public to understand um, 
do all towns and schools in Vermont have access to the same level of prevention programming? They do not. They do not. That? Currently in Vermont, there are um, huge gaps because the funding is competitive and the funding is limited. So you do have areas in the, in the state that really do not have any prevention funding. So that, you know, that and the federal fund, a number of us have federal funding, but that's competitive as well. So when you look, I wish we had brought the state map because you can really see that there's certain counties like Essex County that's really has a gap in um, prevention efforts. We down in the in the Wyndham County, we've been really fortunate that we've had prevention funding and our coalition for 20 years have had sustained funding. Um, and the result has been sustained decreases in substance use, but in other areas of the state, that's not the case. Thank you. Um, and then you touched on um, educating parents about locking up drugs and alcohol in the home. What does that look like? Right now, um, in our area, we're doing a campaign called um, Parenting in the Pandemic because we've been really worried about more youth home unsupervised. And it's about having the conversation with your youth about expectations and then securing any substances, locking them up, um, you know, alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs, and to, and to be treating marijuana and alcohol the same as you do your prescription drugs because we know that they should be out of reach. Um, so really having the discussion with your, with your youth about why you're locking them up and then making sure that they're secure in the home. And then uh, another example um, of that is disposing of unused, unused or expired prescription drugs so that they're not in the home. And there's been um, a number of statewide and local campaigns around um, disposing properly of your unused meds. So I wonder about that related to cannabis. So there might be a parent who purchases cannabis for the first time or the first time in a long time from a retail store, uh, uses some of it and doesn't care for it. And, you know, some guidance on how to dispose of that properly. What would that look like? Someone else want to take that? Yeah, we've done a lot of that in Chittenden County where um, we've educated pharmacists um, around opiates. So I imagine something similar. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know, I want to speak for the police departments, but I know they'll take um, opiates back and now they're also taking vapes. So maybe they would also take, um, you know, unused cannabis products as well, which I'm, I want to guess that I think people throw those in there sometimes anyway. So I think that would probably be a good good partnership. And I guess I would also add just making sure that all parents, um, you know, see the resources that are available. I think I mentioned this at one point, um, but there's a lot of parents that I've run into that have never heard of Parent Up, and it's a, I think it's a really great place to go ask your questions and get some information, um, but they just, you know, the marketing budget is not the same as it is for Coca-Cola, for example. <laughs> So it'd be great to find um, ways to get that more, more um, awareness of that so people know where to go for questions. Cindy, Jessica, Kate, thank you uh, so much for being here. Um, I had a question. You had, I think, given us kind of a, a recommendation that every time ownership of a license um, changes hands, um, relicensing and uh, retraining of um, you know, what to do, what to say, how to educate folks. Um, I, I would imagine you're, you're referencing at a retail level. And I know you mentioned your six points on prevention strategies, but I'm curious from a training perspective, and maybe it kind of even goes into how to dispose, like Julie just mentioned, but what types of training um, or education can, can retailers at that level provide folks that may have youth in their home on, on what to do, you know, or, you know, I know, obviously, you've got to check an ID at the door, that kind of thing, if, if a youth is, is trying to purchase illegally, but, but what kind of training exercises in your experience would be would be helpful from an education standpoint that the board can really uh, dig into? For the retailers? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the way I understood one of your recommendations yes. from the voter perspective. And, you know, I think the yep. board is super, super interested in education to the state more broadly. But yes, but I think sure. it should be similar to the education that the Department of Liquor and Lottery do for alcohol and tobacco. So they start off with what is the law so that the retailers are very clear on what the law is and what the consequences of providing to a minor are. Um, the other piece is um, how to properly um, do ID checks. And typically they pass around licenses and so they're teaching the retailers specifically how to identify a false ID. They talk about um, techniques to not provide to a minor and what are typical things that a minor might do when they come into a retailer. For instance, they might park in the back they walk around the store, they wander around, you know, being knowledgeable. Also, how to refuse a sale. All the techniques of how to properly refuse a sale um, in keeping yourself safe. An example is you don't leave the product on the counter, you immediately put it under the counter when you say that you're gonna refuse the sales. All sorts of components um, in that training I think would be very similar to um, a, a, a training for a marijuana retailer. Yeah, and then the, and add, so I understand your question. It's also about like what to help the retailers help the parents who might be going in. Um, so I think Department of Liquor and Lottery, they've had some educational materials that um, we've put out before. I, I would imagine it could be training them to remind parents, you know, keep this out of reach of youth in your home. Make sure you lock it up after every time you use it. And, uh, you know, our organization, we just purchased some lockable medicine bags to give out to people um, as part of that effort as well. So that could be potentially something um, that could be scaled up for coalitions across the state could provide that or something like that. Great. Thank you. And in, in the three of your experience, those techniques that Liquor and Lottery provides have been relatively successful? Absolutely. And the in-person are the most effective. You know, they found through research over the years that those that participate in an in-person training um, have a higher rate of successful compliance. Um, I think now with, since the pandemic, they've, re they've really upped their game on virtual trainings and, and there hasn't been research yet, but that might be a possibility as well. I think the really beneficial piece about the online training is many of us are present during those trainings. And so we're introducing ourselves, we're introducing resources, and we're introducing preventing components. And we're also recognizing those, um, those retailers that have successful compliances. Yeah, and one of the other things that I'm thinking about and, and in one of in the purview of 164, one of the things we need to decide as a board is delivery services and how does this type of issue, you know, somebody showing up with to somebody's doorstep and what do they need to do, just check an ID, so on and so forth. And so that's something that the board is also considering and thinking about. So mm -hmm. uh, putting that bug in your ear. <laughs> if you have any more thoughts, you know, we'll, we'll, we can engage further down the road when we kind of get a little bit more under our feet on how we feel about that kind of process. Um, I've got a just question, a comment first, which is I hear your concerns around a dedicated fund for the Department of Health. Um, and so thank you for flagging that. Um, I think that was kind of the, I mean, I think that was the intention of the law, but it didn't, they didn't go all the way. Um, so is 10, is 10 million dollars, which is kind of the cap of the, of the money that's dedicated to prevention, is that enough to kind of scale up your prevention initiatives and fill those geographic gaps that exist around the state? And maybe you haven't thought about how to spend 10 million dollars quite yet, but uh, I'm just curious if, if that seems like roughly the, the right amount. That's a good question. <laughs> um, you can think about it. You don't have to have an answer for us today. And I yeah. know that you know this is some. This is an ongoing conversation, and it's it's uh, you know nothing you say here today would prevent you know 
prevention works or others from coming back to the table at a later date. Right. You know, ideally, I would see that we would have a community coalition in every area of the state. And when I think of area, if I thought of supervisory union, this is the area that's covered. For instance, I'm the Wyndham Southwest Supervisory Union, so I cover five towns. Um, if we could have a coalition in every one of those areas with a minimum of $100,000 to at least get started, I think that would be a really great start. And, you know, I don't, I'm not aware of how many supervisor unions are. I'd have to do the math on that. So to me, maybe 10 million is not enough, but I think what's really important is that we start looking at the gaps around the state and make sure that we have prevention strategies covering every area. Yeah, I know how, I know how stressful having to continuously go after competitive grants can be. Yeah, and that's, that's a major issue. It's, um, you know, coalitions come and coalitions go because the funding is not sustainable. And, you know, our hope is that this funding would maybe may lend to more sustainable efforts. And the, and the other piece is that generally the grants are two to three years. So when you're hitting that three years and you're not, you're in the competitive process again, you've got staff that they don't know if they're gonna have a job the next year. And so you're losing dedicated staff as well because the funding is not sustained. Um, did I hear that there was a, a map that kind of identifies services that are available and you know, in particular the gaps in those services? Yeah, through the Substance Misuse Prevention Committee, a map was created and I can make sure that we get that to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions for um, um, prevention work? Do you have knowledge of um, education programs on college campuses? So there are some college campuses that have um, more robust substance use prevention programs than others. So like UVM, for example, um, has a whole team as part of their, um, I believe it's called the Living Well Department. Um, that focuses on prevention efforts and, and other um, health programs for students. But depending on the size of the university, um, what is available to the student body is drastically different from school to school. Um, and while there are places on college campuses for students to have access to support, um, that isn't as easy for those who don't choose to go on to college. So we do have data that shows um, that those who don't choose to go to school are more likely to use substances at higher rates than those who are in college, partially because we don't have access to them in the same way to provide those prevention programs. Thank you. Yeah, that kind of gets back to, to one of the questions I asked Dr. Valenti was, was how does the board help those 18 to 21 year olds that might not have it sick fall through the cracks from a you know educational perspective on on these issues so thank you all really appreciate it thank you thank you so much thank you thank you so if you would like to make a public comment please raise your virtual hand um, and we'll go in the order that they come up and then we'll move to people that are potentially joined by the phone. I don't know if I see any. See and then if you don't have public comment, no, okay. Um, then, so we'll start with, um, what is it? Cannibal Farms. Unmute yourself and turn on your mic or un turn on your video if you would like. I'll leave the video off. Great. Great, well feel free uh, to- I have a question uh, about how the state plans to do the funding um, and remain competitive for the farmers. I mean, I know that the, the funding for prevention is a key, key part, but with states like California having to bail their own cannabis industry out um, because the, the taxes are so high that the underground is back to being the the better price than the legal farm. I was just wondering if you could elaborate at all on that. 
Um, I'm not sure that we're in a position to talk about uh, funding. Of course, a lot of those decisions actually get made in the in the legislative branch. Um, the Cannabis Board kind of takes our cues and, and develops regulations. Um, so if there are funding opportunities like the Social Development Equity Fund, that those are those are legislatively decided. Uh, so. Um, uh, next on our list, is it Mariah Flynn? Sanderson. Sanderson. Feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your video. Hi, um, thanks for giving me a chance to speak. I just wanted to um, kind of comment and respond to a couple of things that I heard from both Andrea and the uh, Prevention Works team. Um, so I also work in the prevention field. I spoke with Kyle yesterday, um, and um, I wanted to kind of offer additional support for the idea to think about how policy and systems in particular can be used to help with prevention efforts, not just funding towards entities that are doing uh, providing supports um, for individuals and relationships in the community, but also thinking about what's our role as a state in um, what the policies need to look like to support prevention. So for me, I think some of what Andrea was kind of quickly going through was that pieces around like taxes actually have one of the biggest impacts right in reducing use youth use and um, and then at a community level looking at that density of retailers and um, um, and the uh, and the how alcohol or how cannabis will be promoted in communities and what kids are exposed to for me is like some of the most important work that we could do around this issue to help protect youth. Um, and as someone who's a strong uh, social justice advocate and really cares a lot about what we're doing in that field in Vermont as well, um, I think it really I work in the um, Burlington community, so I think you can see the impact of density and advertising in a way that you, in that community, in a way that you sometimes can't in some of the more rural areas of Vermont on our BIPOC community members and our um, lower income uh, community members, because there is a density of retailers and advertising in communities where, um, where those two populations are living in Burlington. So in thinking about how to be, um, supportive and, um, in a, in a state who's moving in the direction of, um, acknowledging social justice and, and doing more work in that area, I think this has a piece of that. Um, this is really important to that work. Um, and I've heard a lot the conversation being around how to ensure that BIPOC community members are part of the business of cannabis, but I want, I'm hoping that there's more discussion and more focus on how to ensure that they're not targeted in the way that alcohol and tobacco have targeted those communities for decades. Um, with this product and that we've we've really designed a community that doesn't do that again. Because I, I, I think I was mentioning to Kyle yesterday that we have an opportunity to do things differently this time and hopefully we take that opportunity. Thank you, Mariah. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Graham. Hey folks, this is Graham Unix, Group Knox Policy Director at Rural Vermont. Um, appreciate seeing everyone's testimony here today. I've also worked with youth on and off for 20 years in different parts of Vermont, and it's, uh, it's great to hear from folks who are still doing that work more than I am. Um, so I specifically just wanted to comment on, on one thing I heard. Uh, the first guest from UVN spoke to labels specifically like organic, natural, et cetera. And I just wanted to speak, speak to the comment that she made. She said that labels like that may affect people's perception that the product is less harmful and link that perception to risk to youth. Um, and I think the fundamental reminder here is that we're talking about an adult marketplace where, where youth are ideally not able to purchase products. Um, and that these labels like organic, like local, local, et cetera, they're labels which speak to specific management practices, which speak to clear standards, um, which do positively affect the health outcomes um, of the individual and the environment in which those plants were grown. Uh, they're clearly defined for people how plants and products are grown and manufactured. Uh, the labeling does not lead to, as she said, false perceptions. In fact, it clarifies any misperceptions by specifically referring to a, a recognized standard. And the point of labeling, uh, like local or organic, and the point of prevention, I, I, in, in my experience uh, working with youth, is not to create a judgment or perception in the subject, such as not to create the idea that the label is right or wrong or that the, the use is right or wrong, 
but it's to honestly and transparently communicate and educate about the product uh, based on, on clear standards and clear evidence. So that was the, the primary point I wanted to make. Um, I think the, the comment about limiting, limiting total number of licenses, um, again, you, you know that we've in general encouraged from the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, we've encouraged um, limiting the scale of licenses as opposed to the number of licenses to provide equitable, more equitable access to the marketplace. And I think a lot of what we hear um, about alcohol and tobacco, which I, I don't think should be you know, equated um, with cannabis as they have been. Um, but the, a lot of the concerns that have emerged in those industries are because of the industries and how they're regulated. And what we've encouraged here in Vermont, at the Cannabis Equity Coalition, is to really make this a craft, locally based industry where large, in, which, where large industry and corporate actors can't come in and create a lot of the, the problematic impacts we've been seeing. Um, but otherwise, you know, I think that we, we certainly agree with a lot of, a lot of what was stated here today um, in, different, in different ways. Thank you all. Thanks, Graham. Okay, uh, next on the list is Tito Byrne. Tito, if you want to mute yourself. Hey there, guys. Uh, so, this has been really tough to listen to. I, I think, like, I think comparing cannabis to tobacco is, it, it just drives me nuts. Um, you know, tobacco is just, uh, unequivocally awful in almost every way. And yet uh, cannabis is, is in many cases, absolutely good for you. And uh, when, um, when, when, when people try to tie the two together, it's just, it never results in anything good. And that's how you, that's how we end up with this awful vape tax that we got. You know, they're, they're trying to, uh, the legislature is trying to address the jewel smoking in high schools, which no doubt is a terrible, awful problem. But then they use um, they use language that's so broad, it's like um, killing a mosquito with a sledgehammer. And uh, anything that uses the word vape is now considered like tobacco. It's just all wrong and misguided. People using a PAX uh, to vape cannabis flower just can't be compared to tobacco in any way whatsoever. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Tito. Thank you, Tito. Uh, next is uh, Melanie Sheehan. Hi. Uh, thank you all for your time. Um, I just wanted to thank my uh, peers in prevention. I also work in the Windsor area. I work at Mount Esketney Hospital in Windsor in the Mount Esketney Prevention Partnership. Um, I just wanted to and also thank all of you, the Cannabis Control Board, for your uh, thoughtful questions and considering these issues. Um, I'm also the uh, vice chair of the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council um, on, on that body. And um, I was just uh, reflecting on some of the questions that you've asked around, you know, strategic visioning, uh, gap areas, funding, best practice strategies. And just on behalf of the council, I just wanted to say that we look forward to collaborating with you as a board. Um, I know that our uh, chair will be joining the advisory group when that gets pulled together, um, but I just wanted to to say that there uh, there are great uh, collaboration opportunities and, and I look forward to that. So thank you. Thank you and thank you for your work with the Substance Misuse Prevention Council. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. Looking forward to it as well. Um, next is Allison Link. Hi there. Wait. I don't know if can you can see and hear me. Hi, Allison Link. I live in Morrisville and I also am part of the prevention community, work for Healthy Lamoille Valley. And so I second what Melanie was saying about our colleagues and about um, the board and the thoughtfulness of questions. My, my questions relate to our local municipalities and towns and how um, you know, to encourage and recommend to the board to consider the local towns and the influence of your decisions and recommendations on the local towns and municipalities, especially those who don't have zoning, who without zoning will have really no ability to, you know, their their CCC will have no ability to really make any additional um, changes um, or, or, you know, create you know, ha have more of their own say mm -hmm. um, to the level that folks with zoning will be able to have. And so to consider along the way, um, I know I don't think any of the presentations they talked specifically about the local towns and municipalities, but 
the, our coalitions, we work directly hand in hand with those um, with those folks. We're trying to get them up to date information as best as possible, so that they can make educated decisions um, about what they want, how they vision, what their vision is for their town. So just to recognize the impact of um, your decisions on local towns and to um, especially those who don't have uh, zoning and may have um, you know other codes involved. Thank you very Thank much you. for that. Thank you. Um, next, I see Ann Gilbert. Um, yes, hello, I'm coming from um, Montpelier, Vermont. I'm the director of Central Vermont New Directions Coalition and we cover all of Washington County. And, you know, like Cindy said before, there used to be many coalitions. There were six serving this area, and now we're um, down to one, but working closely with Central Vermont Medical Center and a team of other providers who are really seeing the crossover of the danger of all the substances. So it's not just the opioids, um, alcohol is an issue. And um, uh, I just wanted to reiterate Dr. Volanti's findings of you know youth experimenting and then moving on to um, other substances as well, and how important it is to continue this work in the community education and um, for funding for all of the schools and um, thinking about the packaging. You know, when vaping first um, came out and we polled kids, many, many kids and parents did not know that there was nicotine or what those substances were in those products. And so, education and the packaging are just going to be crucial and I appreciate all the work that you're doing and that everyone in the prevention community has had a chance to express some um, great knowledge uh, today. Thanks. Thank you. So are there any others that joined via the link that would like to provide comments and if you do just please raise your virtual hand. Okay, we have one person it looks like who's joined by phone. Um, if you'd like to provide public comment, now would be the opportunity. Okay, well, we're gonna take a break. Um, we'll be back uh, at one o'clock. I gotta thank all of our witnesses thus far. Um, it's been a hugely impactful day. Um, and we have a few other great witnesses for the afternoon. Um, but for now, we're gonna be back at one o'clock. Um, Kyle, if you could pause the recording and um, put up our away message. You got it. One second. Okay, uh, sorry about the slight delay. It's 1.04, we're back from our lunch break. Um, we're here with our next witness, Holly Morehouse from Vermont After School. Um, the after school program did get a, um, a little bit of money from in Act 164. And so I'd love to hear just uh, your thoughts and how we can, you know, effectively and safely implement an adult, adult use program in Vermont. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for being here. Thank you for paying attention to our young people and, and what all these changes mean. Um, it was also great to hear the other folks uh, present this morning. Um, and I hope that what I can focus on will add, only add to, to what they're, okay. um, what they were uh, speaking to. Um, I'm going to share the slides um, with you all. There they are. Great. Awesome. Um, so some quick background. Vermont After School is a statewide nonprofit. Uh, we've been around since 2009. Uh, we are really focused on ensuring that all of Vermont's children, youth, and young adults have opportunities to be active, engaged, connected, and heard. We really feel like those are the keys to um, well-being um, and you know lifelong success, right? If you're enga you know, engaged in things, you have opportunities to be active, connected, all around the relationships, um, and heard is the whole youth voice piece. Where we choose to focus our time is really working with youth-serving organizations, after-school summer programs, teen centers that are supporting children and youth in Vermont outside the school day and over the summer. Um, one of the, the reasons that we want to focus on that area is because of the amount of time. 
um, that young people are spending in this space. Uh, this graphic uh, really talks about those spaces. We call it the third space for youth. It's the space outside of home and school, um, and recognizing that what happens in the home, of course, is critical to growth and development, um, what happens in the school and the formal education systems as well, but really what is special about that third space, where they are you know, playing sports, hiking mountains, I mean, you know, doing scouts, robotics, um, you know, first work opportunities, hanging out with friends, and how critical that is to their development. There have been studies that have shown that up to 80% of a teenager's time is in that third space. So it, it's not a small amount of space when you take, of their waking hours. When you take into account the weekends, the summers, uh, the afternoons if they get out early on an early release days, um, and the evenings and so forth. So um, I think part of our message is to make sure that any of our approaches uh, around prevention or any issue that we critically care about for children and youth, that we don't only sort of do this dual thing of let's only look at home and school, and thinking of those are the only two places where young people are, but really, pay attention to this third space as well. Some of the data on why after school, um, as you said, there, there is an appropriation um, with some of the tax revenue dollars to increase access to after school and summer learning. So I wanted to walk through just some of the, the data behind that. Um, when you look at the hours that uh, teenagers, young adolescents are most likely to engage in risky behaviors, uh, be victims of crime, commit crime, in car accidents, the studies show that it is really the hours of 3 to 6, 3 to 7 in some cases. It's not 10 p.m. at night. So some of our assumptions about where teenagers are getting in trouble um, is really that time when school is out, uh, but family members are still at work, um, and they don't have a place to be. Um, there are also studies that show um, you know, these distinct differences in risky behaviors, drug use, delinquency, on whether or not uh, a young person is involved in constructive and supervised activities. Um, it does not have to be all school-based. It does not have to be tutoring and science, although those are great too, but it's, it's being engaged um, with other young people with a caring um, adults um, in, in a structured place. Um, another study I, um, cited in the other handout that I sent in has all the citations for these. Um, the teens who don't participate in the structured activities are nearly three times more likely to skip classes, experiment with drugs, engage in sexual activity than teens who do. Um, Paul, do you mind if I try and just change? It's just a, it feels it a little bit more like a conversation. It's a, I know it's silly, but is this? I'm sorry. That's right. I just I want to be able to be able to see you. Oh, I know. I mean, I can talk to that camera, but I, then I feel like I have to back to you. <laughs> We're still there. You can't see Kyle, I don't think. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'll try to like do this, this thing. Is, this is our first time in a setting yeah. like this. With yeah, a live no, witness. mine too. Yeah, so okay. it's hard to know like yeah. where to focus. Yeah. Um, I think the other side of the actual problems, um, not just the idea that okay, if they're in a program, they're probably not using while they're sitting in that program, let's hope, right? <laughs> um, so it's not just that space, but it's also the protective factors that get built. It's, a, it's about that sense of self, a sense of identity. Um, I'm not lonely, I'm not bored, I'm not alone. I'm actually engaged in yeah. band or sports or I have my own music group or drama or whatever it is. Um, there's all studies that show you know, um, self-control, um, sense of self, self-agency, all increase with regular participation. Um, we've also seen in Vermont, we've had a, a major initiative to focus on social emotional learning and trauma informed practice um, and are seeing you know, where you have staff that are skilled and able to help you through that. Hopefully we can um, mitigate some of that, those generational issues when they've experienced trauma in their own life. Um, looking at the Vermont Youth Risk um, Survey data um, as well, um, 2017 and 2019, a uh, question was added about for high schoolers, how many hours per week are you participating? Um, when you look at that participation, 10 hours or more, across the board, all kinds of risky behaviors you see go down. I mean, it's from bullying to driving without a seatbelt to um, you know, cannabis, marijuana use, alcohol, and so forth. Um, you also see in that same data source that um, when you look at the sense of belonging, for young people who participate 10 hours or more in an after-school program, about 70% of them feel like they really matter in their community, they really belong, compared to those who are not participating at all, it drops down to 
Um, so significant difference there. Um, also, two out of three Vermont parents, uh, this is from a different study, um, agree that after school programs make it less likely that youth will engage in risky behaviors. Um, that's a 2020 study. If we have some questions, should we wait till the end? Would you prefer that? Um, it's fine either way. It really is for us. Let me go a little okay. bit further. Sure. Yeah, do your thing. And then, um, but I have time that I hope so okay. that they'll okay. be like yeah. half of this and then like yeah. let's really dig in. Yep. Um, I am. Um, the other part, the thing I wanted to mention is that through um, Vermont After School, we haven't only been looking at what works in Vermont or across the nation. We've been looking at international models as well. Um, many of us in the prevention world have seen, you know, the studies from Iceland um, and the dramatic results that they've had. Uh, Vermont, Vermont After School, the five communities we're working with were the first in North America to actually sign on with Iceland and Planet Youth to pilot some of that here. Um, we have expanded on that model and what we're calling the Vermont Youth Project to also draw from Finland. Um, there's another example where they have, you know, some of the best test scores and education outcomes, also one of the shortest school days. So when you think about third space in Finland, it's even longer than it is here. So some of the questions that, you know, we had was, well, what are they doing with that third space? Well, they have a whole field of field work. Um, with trained professionals, you know, bachelor's and master's, a PhD in adolescent, in young people and how to support them all the way through. And they have youth centers in every neighborhood where you're really looking at those hours of 12 noon to 9 p.m. having artisans come in and theater projects and the whole idea is that every young person in Finland will have a hobby or a passion. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to socially connect, it's a way to grow your self-identity. In Iceland, the approach um, really has been, I mean, Cindy talked about it earlier with that ecological model where you look at the whole society. Um, and they, they have started out focusing largely on sports center. So you're a young person in Iceland, you go to school till one or two, a van or a bus picks you up and it takes you to the sports center and you spend two or three hours like engaged in some activity that you really, right? So you're a physical activity as a young person, you've had the learning, your parents pick you up at the end of the day. Like you, you change that whole society around young people. For the Vermont Youth Project, I think that's one of the biggest messages, is not just focusing on the young person making a good decision, but on changing our society around them. So as a board, in the recommendations you're making, I'm hoping that the more you can think about the society that we're creating around our young people um, and how that connects to prevention. Where it's coming from, really, is to not look at just in the green where Oftentimes we think about substance use, like why are they using, right? Well, you know, they're not engaged in school, they're bored, whatever. But really going further back and saying, okay, why are they bored? <laughs> why are they, right? So in Vermont, often it's transportation in our rural communities, right? They go home on the bus and then they can't get anywhere else. You know, so what can we do as a society that instead of says, you know, oh, you know, you're home alone, bored, you shouldn't be that you know you should be doing that you should be more engaged but we haven't supported you in figuring out like how to get there and make that possible um, the other thing that I think is important in this model and that we draw from you know some of those other national examples and international examples is really really recognizing that this time in a human beings life adolescence middle school high school young adulthood um, is so critical to the brain development and I know that was mentioned earlier this morning as well um, you know, that cortex frontal lobe, that reasoning, that making good decisions and always consistently thinking through the consequences is not fully developed. Right? So to focus prevention efforts on make good decisions, really understand the consequences is really going against human development and science. When you look at the Iceland model, they just stopped doing that. They're like, they don't, when they talk, they don't like talk about prevention with their youth. They just change society with this idea that every young person in Iceland has the right to grow up substance-free. So what does that mean? It means changing societal norms nobody's using. If nobody's using, then you're not going out with your friends and drinking or using, right? Because nobody else is. If all the parents sort of have that common messaging um, around whether it's a curfew or spending time with your family, um, then that's your norm. And even if you're, not in a, if you're in a family that's not as engaged, what they have found is if all your friends are, that rubs off. So as a societal investment, um, there's, there's big bang for your buck. They have found over the last 20 years, they'll say they had the worst teenagers um, in Europe <laughs> as far as use rates. Um, they have 
uh, about 20 years ago, they had um, 20 or so facilities that were dedicated just towards adolescent drug and alcohol misuse. Over that period of time, they've been able to close all but two. So think about cost savings. When you change the society, it no longer becomes a thing that, that you're doing as a young person there um, and the cost, use, um, the cost savings there. Um, the other thing I want to point out in the connection to after school in particular are third space programs at this period of development and why I think it's so great uh, that some of this uh, revenue um, can go to support programs for youth is that um, in this period of time, adolescent brains are actually rewiring. And we often talk about brain development for birth to five, which is the most critical, right? A lot's happening. Adolescence is the second one, <laughs> right? They're parsing off things. They're actually reshaping their brain. So we have to think as a society, what environments do we want these young people in as they're reshaping their brains? Um, do we want them doing robotics, right, and club sports, or you know, hanging out with supportive adults? Do we want them doing service projects? And what do we want in that 80% of their waking hours that they're spending outside of home and school? Um, and how, do we, how is that going to shape their brains? So there's a piece of this for me that's around what environments are they in, how important those after school and third space programs are to help shape those brains beyond the school day, beyond the home. Also, how to, and Cindy said this this morning, delay the onset of youth, of use. Protect those adolescent brains. If we can get that message to parents and families, business owners, decision makers, protect, like really see this period in time as unique and so, so important, and instead of setting up policies that go against what their brains are doing, risk-taking, you know, sensation, peer pressure, instead of trying to go against their brains, treasure their brains, protect their brains, and set up our prevention measures to really support that time in life until they become 25, 26, and then, it, then it's a different scenario. Um, the, Vermont Youth Project, there are five communities that are participating in this. As far as the after school programs and so forth, that is statewide. We are working with programs you know, all across the state. Um, Governor Scott, major initiative about universal access that is tying directly to this prevention work. Um, the, youth, the Vermont Youth Project communities are trying to go a step deeper and really take everything we're talking about here and think about how do we change our communities um, in their entirety. So they've signed on to a five year. Uh, project. We're in the second year of the pilot. We do use the Iceland survey. They do have these community-wide strategy building teams. We've added in youth councils and youth voice, which is really coming from the Finland side. Um, they have data. Um, it's different from the YRBS um, in a couple of ways. Um, I would say, I'm not going to go deep into the data here, and much of it aligns with what you've already heard. I will say the thing that's different about this data is that it's it's real time, so they take the survey, they survey all 7th through 12th graders in October, and we have the results back and the analysis back um, by the end of December. So it is those kids in that community at that moment in time. The response rate um, in our first year pre-COVID was 82%. Um, last year with COVID and virtual learning it was 65%. We're hoping to see that go, go back over 80. The other thing that's different about this data um, is that it doesn't just get at the use rate. So It'll have, you know, who's using marijuana and when do they start. It gets at, it has questions about behind that, where. Where are you using, when, and the why. You know, what is, it, what is, what is your impression of peers who smoke, right, or use. Um, some of the findings that we have found, um, and that especially when we compare ourselves to Iceland and some of the other nations that are, are doing this work, our cannabis use and alcohol use in Vermont is high. It's just high, you know that. Um, parent and family engagement is strong in, in Vermont, like we're spending time with our youth, which is different than Iceland and some other places, but what we're not doing is we're not partnering together as parents. You're setting your own rules in your house, I'm setting my own, and then when my young person wants to go do something, they're like, well, everybody else is doing it, right? Whereas if we spent more time on this sort of co-collaboration, we could change sort of that, that norm. Um, we are also seeing that third space activities, the after school programs, that unorganized free time um, is prevalent in many of our communities in Vermont. Um, these are examples of some of the data um, so that you have it. Like I said, it lines up with um, other data that has been shared here. It does get at 
um, such as this 15% of 11th and 12th grade students report smoking marijuana increases peer respect. So it has these elements that sort of try to get at the why. Um, the other data that is, especially in the 2020, are, is there's some mental health and COVID data, um, which I think is also something really important to look at. So, you know, over half increased loneliness and bored. Um, there's high rates of young people saying things have gotten to the point that they can't even handle them. Um, sleeplessness, like 30% of our young people experienced sleeplessness in the last week. Like all those signs um, that we need to pay attention to in the prevention world. The biggest point I think I want to make is that when it comes to Vermont, and this is, I really appreciate what the governor is doing. Um, right now, what you have access to in that third space, it's kind of a luck of a draw, right? It's where you live, what community you're in. In some communities, they've got programming five days a week, they've got all summer, they've got all ages. And the next community over, there's nothing. <laughs> um, the other thing that plays in is income level um, and what you can afford to do. If you have money in Vermont, you can go to a bodice camp one week and basketball camp the next, and then you go to lacrosse, and then you're in, you know, you're at the Flynn Center and you're doing a play. Like you can develop that brain that we're talking about and have all these experiences. Um, if you don't have those resources, you're not doing any of those things. So those brains are developing very differently, and that's going to have implica implications going forward. Um, the most recent study was from December 2020. It was released. Um, there's more than 26,000 children and youth in Vermont that would be in a program this afternoon um, or during this day in the summer um, if more were available. The biggest barriers are accessibility. They can't get to them. Availability, they don't exist in their community and affordability. And that was based on a parent survey. So the money in that bill to expand access is so critically important. Um, if we're going to have this, this brain development um, and brain protection. Some of the things that have been happening and, and prior to this, the Opioid Coordination Council and the Marijuana Commission both named um, increasing after schools in their top recommendations. Governor Scott stated the state address before COVID laid out um, universal access as a goal. Um, last year, the legislature passed a bill to create the task force. That report is now out and included the funding in the Marijuana Commercialization Bill. And the last couple of months, there's been this huge push on summer um, and summer programming for all ages, not just young, all ages, as part of Vermont's recovery effort. Um, as far as the money goes, the communities are ready. You know, we had the tobacco settlement money. We had $600,000. We got over $5 million, $5.5 million in requests from communities all over. Like, they are ready for it. The Summer Matters grants, we started with 1.5 million. We opened those grants up. We got something like 7.3 million in requests in like a 10-day turnaround. Like people are ready. Um, we're ready as a state. We're run after school. We know how to support systems and structures and professional development. Um, we know what the answers are already. We, we just need the funding, right, to flow. We need the, the workforce um, to go with that. Um, I think I'm going to stop here for questions, the lessons learned and recommendations um, we can move to, but I want to make sure we hit um, all those Thank questions. You. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I just want to ask about the Iceland and Finland mm -hmm. um, information that you talked about because they've seen a reduction in mm -hmm. youth use, but adults, I would assume, are still using alcohol in Iceland. I don't believe it's a dry country. So where did they find that nexus of this is for adults and not for youth. Can you talk more about how they communicate, how they, how did they change society? Um, of my understanding, um, right, it's going back to that brain piece and delay the onset. So what, where, you know, when you have that mixed messaging that it's safe to use, right, or that it's responsible use is okay, right, um, you got to have that piece of, but not for these brains, right? Not for this age, because their brains are still developing, and we don't want to muck with that development. So, they'll 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 talk about delay the onset, and they'll measure, and they're trying to continually push back when they have their first drink, when they first try a substance, right, and push that back, because the other studies have shown that the more you push that back, the less likely someone is to use or to become addicted, right? Because if you're using, well, that brain is developing in the prefrontal, right? you're going to be more prone towards addiction. Like you're changing your brain chemistry and structure, right? 
I'm not a neuroscience, but that, you know, that's, you know, scientists. But um, so, so I think it's that messaging. And it's, um, so if you think about, like I've heard them say, young people in Iceland have the right to grow up substance free. So, um, you know, let them get the strongest, best, healthiest brain and then make their choices from there, right? Um, there was um, one of the speakers um, was talking about this image of, you know, in the U.S., we have this, you know, we have this mythology. We talk about, um, you know, the youth who makes the best, you know, they're against all adversity. They have the worst conditions and this and that and the other, and they're facing all this, and they still succeed, right? So we praise and we lift up the example of the young person who swims upstream and is still successful. What Iceland and Finland are trying to do is you change the direction of the stream, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So wherever you jump in, there's a, you're right, like, and that means removing advertising. You know, I know you talked about that this morning. You know, that means that um, everybody, uh, you have an outlet for that adrenaline rush that you seek at that age, and Iceland and sports, and Finland is like, you know, the artisans, or it could be sports, you know, it, it's your hobby, it's your passion. You have a place to channel that, to take risks. Um, so you work with, with the brain around that. So I think it's that communication. I suddenly spent a lot of time on uh, family spending time together mm -hmm. and measuring what that looks like. Um, you know, they still, as a society, they'll tell you, like parents, um, as it's coming up to a school holiday or whatever, you'll get an email from the city of Reykjavik that's like, don't forget, there's a holiday coming up. Is it really important to spend time with your young people? Yeah. Right? So it's not focusing all the prevention language on the middle and high schoolers, it's on the parents and the families mm -hmm. and the society around it. Um, and it seems to help, like you're not saying no forever, right? right? Yeah. You're saying protect this time. Um, Finland, the flip is, they they do things like they, I visited Olu, which is a city in sort of northern Finland, they had designed their whole system so that a nine-year-old could navigate it by, it, by themselves. Wow. So they have bike paths that never cross roads or um, they have bridges that you go over, right? And so you, you as a nine-year-old, you can get places. So you can have agency, mm -hmm. you can be engaged. And that's kind of their litmus test. So what would it mean in Vermont if we sort of switched, right? Yeah. And thought, let's design from that level um, so that they can be engaged. Instead of trying to solve the problems after they're not engaged, they can't have access to programs. Now they're bored, now they're you know <laughs> going down this way, and then we, we sort of come in. Do they also leverage that sort of co-collaborative parenting? Like, I mean, like, you're yes. right, right? If I don't like yeah. a particular video game and I won't have it in my house, my kid can just get on his bike and ride down the street yes. and play at his friend's house, you know? And <laughs> right. I, I've completely lost control of that. Yeah. Do they leverage that? And they I do. Think? And where, because with their survey data, um, in the Iceland case, like, we have data. We know where are you. So where they're accessing and drinking is not often in their own home. It's the home, the home of a friend when someone's not there. Where they're getting the substances and alcohol is from an adult friend who is not a family member. So we're, we're starting to learn these things. Mm -hmm. You know, so how do we, you know, the challenge is how do you get parents to all sort of come together? The other story they kind of tell is, um, this is, uh, Dr. Mann is one of their um, researchers, and he's like, if you don't think young people are coming together to fight against adults, right, and to like sort of outsmart all of us, you're crazy. They are. So why aren't we? Sort of like, <laughs> hey, you know, if everybody in our kids' friend group or whatever all agrees to the same sort of thing, it just takes that whole piece out. Yeah. We parent in isolation. I mean, um, and that makes it really hard because you got to have a lot of those one-on-one -on -one conversations instead of, okay, well, where are you going to go? No one else is there. You know, no one else is out at that time. Right. Everybody's in the after-school program. Everybody's in the summer program. Everybody's, you know, got a summer gig, you know, or yeah. something going on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, some of what you just mentioned kind of goes back to the question that I asked uh, Prevention Works was, at the point of sale, at least, we can really – we can train retailers to identify somebody who is under 21, mm -hmm. but what can we do from an education perspective as a board to folks that are legally purchasing this and then going back to their home or their community, you know what I mean? And really make sure everybody's on the same page um, with respect to how this is gonna function in their yeah. you know, cluster, household, whatever, whatever you wanna call it. I don't know if you have any 
comments yes. on that, but I have another question. The di like a diagram of the brain science. Mm -hmm. Like put that front and center, adolescent brains, frontal lobe, what's still developing. If, if people can get the message that you're not being kind to share or you're not, oh, they're old enough or something like that, but you're actually impairing their future, like their brain development, their future growth. Like if we can understand that, because we're not going to give a substance to a four-year-old, yep. right? Because we understand that. So we need to understand up yeah, to 25, 26. Yep. We need to understand that just as strongly. Mm -hmm. um, I got one more question. Yeah. And maybe I should have asked some of our previous speakers this who might be more familiar with the data. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so when we, when we think about the impression that some youth might have on other youth who use mm -hmm. cannabis, um, is there any kind of more nuanced data that goes into the types of products that seem cool, for lack of a better way to describe it, that other youth or adolescents are using, whether that's smoking products? I mean, I know that there's not really um, other types of cannabis products easily as accessible, I would imagine, in the state currently. Mm -hmm. But is there any data out there that kind of, you know, what are kids attracted to more? What are, what are the youth pursuing if they're going to, you know, band together against their parents and go use cannabis? Is it a smokable flour or is it edibles? You know. Um, I don't know if Dr. Avanti has some of that in her. Yeah, I was or trying to remember. And we I should have, have asked that question. We have in our data, we have what are the perceptions and why, like who's cool what. We don't have it broken down within the type of substance. Um, but if you hang with any young people, you can get that information, right? It's what others are doing. Mm -hmm. It's go, you go back to you know, what's risky, what's new, what's right. the fad, what's the you yeah. Know. I'm sure it changes right. week to week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but prevention, yeah, prevention networks talk about like the flavors. Like take <clears> out <throat> the things that make it, yeah. you know, fun. And well, I'm even I'm even thinking along the lines of okay, let's say you have somebody selling at a retail operation and they're buying uh, a parent is buying gummies. Mm -hmm. And that retail operation can say, hey, just so you know, kids are more likely to, you know, try and use these if you're not taking care of them responsibly or putting them in mm -hmm. a, a place where they don't know if you're leaving them on your coffee table, yeah. so on and so forth, versus other types of products that might also be available in the store. Yeah. Well. I don't know if we're at that granular level yet with research, at least in the state. I'm sure that there's some. It seems like you'd address that with everything that's purchased, right? Because yes. things might be cool this week, but something else is the fad the next week. Right. So the you, the it's information a, yeah. you give might be a little bit more. Yeah, fair enough. Just universal. thinking out loud. Right. On yeah, how we can kind of and it is thinking about what we are doing as a society, yeah. right? <laughs> to allow this, you know, the marketing and the making it more and more like gummies and this and that, right? Like, you know, they did, you know, in the I think it was Prevention Works was talking about. Anything that's going to appeal to adults is going to trickle down in some way too, mm -hmm. um, you know. So if we're, if as a society we're going to allow those, if we're going to allow advertising, if we're going to allow the retail, if we're going to allow that, then how do we just like you know keep thinking about that protection um, and where we're focusing the responsibility for protecting their brains? It's not all on the you know it's not all the education to the young people. That's you know it's the um, to protect their own brains. Yeah, so not fully I'm, not, developed yet. I'm not trying to insinuate that one may, yeah. may or may not be safer to use yeah. than the other, but yeah. from the perspective of, you know, where is the most targeted education yeah. needed yeah. Uh, for this part of the community? Yeah. Um, well, I hate to cut this conversation yeah. short. Um, you know, I know we got a little bit of a late start, um, but thank you for being here. Absolutely. You know, this is obviously the, the beginning of the conversation and, um, you know, we look forward to doing what we can to kind of support, mutually support our, our missions. That's great. Yeah. And I know that we can make real and lasting change Absolutely. by investing in that third space yep. mm -hmm. and changing the, you know, where our young people are. So. I, I noticed your one slide just said, you know, 21,000 enrolled, 26,000 no access. Is that roughly kind of the amount of youth in Vermont that would be participating? Yeah, that the 26,000 came from a, um, it was a parent-based survey yep. um, okay. that asked, you know, if if you could, would your child yep. be in yep. a young person? And that, that was the, gotcha. the estimate that came Great. back from that. So that's the best number we have. That's the most recent. That's a December 2020 number. Yep. Is that up on our screen? 
No. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I thank you again. Sorry, I, I just um, we were a little bit um, tight on time this afternoon. No, I totally but, appreciate yeah. it. And any follow up questions, yeah. anything yeah. I can do to help support? You've Great. got some important decisions to make. Yeah. Right. Um, so thank you for. for Thanks for this time. conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Holly. We well, really appreciate it. Well, so our next guest is here. Um, Dr. Jenny Pearson uh, is joining us um, from Nevada, uh, who has about a year head start. Um, you're an associate professor at the University of Nevada. Um, again, you've worked very closely with one of our previous witnesses, Dr. Andrea Vellante, um, who presented earlier today and was just so incredibly knowledgeable. Um, I think I can say that you also serve on the Nevada Cannabis um, Advisory Commission. Is that, is that right? That's, that's great. So, I, you know, I asked uh, if you would join us to kind of give just some of your thoughts about, um, you know, the, the issues that we're going to be facing, you know, as a state, not just as the cannabis board, um, but in how we can kind of address those head on and get ahead of them, as opposed to kind of just react to them after the fact. Um, and so I, I know, you know, this can be a conversation, you can kind of just tell, tell us how you want to proceed, but um, uh, we're here to kind of learn from you. Oh, you, I, think you're, I think you're muted. There we go. <laughs> yeah, over a year experience living on Zoom every day and yet, you know, <laughs> challenging. Um, so thank you for the invitation and absolutely, you know, Dr. Valanti is, is um, all that, as we, as we say, with the kids, with my undergraduates. Um, so I, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare slides, so uh, please forgive me. I'm just going to kind of talk on three different topics, and I'm happy to present in the future with more, you know, with slides, with, with you know, p-values and 95% confidence intervals, if you'd like to see those. Um, we, we, uh, we certainly have all that data, but just, uh, you know, time, we're, time we're very, Yeah, we're very early on in our kind of, in, in the life of this board. And so honestly, the kind of broad overview is actually probably more helpful for us. Okay, great. So I, I first, because, you know, we don't know each other, I just want to kind of give you a little statement of my kind of position on cannabis legalization. And um, what I want you all to know is I am incredibly supportive of legalization. I think it was the right decision for Nevada. I am happy to see it happening. I think it's a social justice and public health imperative. And so what I'm really interested in doing is using my knowledge, especially from tobacco control, but now being in cannabis for about three years, we, we ended up having legal sales start July 1st, 2017. So we've been doing this for a little while. Um, and I, I've, I've had a, a study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, um, yeah, National Institute on Drug Abuse since uh, 2018, uh, looking at adolescent cannabis use and cannabis advertising. So, um, you know, I just want to put that out there that I am very supportive, but I would like to see us, um, you know, use regulations to align companies' incentives with the kind of public health and public safety goals that I think states want to see, right? So I think pretty universally, um, we all acknowledge and the data supports that the overwhelming majority of, of people over 21 can use cannabis without any problems and in fact with a lot of pleasure, right? It can bring a lot of, 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 of positive experiences to people's lives. And for a lot of people who have medical uses for cannabis, it can really improve their quality of life. I think there's a lot of research that still needs to be done on that, but certainly people's individual experiences are very valuable. And I've, I've seen that myself in Nevada. Um, I think we could all also agree that we don't want to see increases on the population level, either among people who um, are over 21 and perhaps have problems controlling their cannabis use. There's a little bit of a, of a misunderstanding that there's no such thing as cannabis dependence. Unfortunately, there are a, not a very small number, but there are people who have a hard time controlling their use. There are people with certain personal characteristics that have 
are at greater risk of having negative outcomes associated with cannabis use. For example, people with um, schizophrenia, if you use cannabis, psychosis gets worse, even though it feels from the individual level like it's better. Um, and, and then oh, I think we could all agree also that on the uh, people under 21, especially, especially adolescents, we don't want to see cannabis use in that group. So I'm going to talk about three different topics um, broadly. I'm going to talk about our experiences uh, concerning changes in cannabis use among people 21 and over. I'm going to talk about uh, our experiences in changes in cannabis use among people under 21. And I'm going to talk about just my kind of general thoughts about advertising and marketing standards with, with the groups, those the, the, the kind of subgroups that I'm going to talk about in those, those two first areas in mind. So first, and, and please feel free to, to stop and ask clarifying questions at any point. So um, first, among people 21 and over in Nevada, we have seen an increase in the proportion of adults who uh, have reported any cannabis use in the past 12 months. Perfectly fine. I don't see any pro public health issues with that, really. Um, we are potentially seeing a small increase in the proportion of people who report um, symptoms of cannabis use disorder, like um, wanting to reduce their use and not being able to. But that's just uh, like a little hint. So I can't really say for certain if that's true or if that's just something that's a blip and it's going to go away. Um, the two groups that I think are most interesting among people who are over 21 are older adults, so people are 65 and older, and uh, pregnant women. So among people 65 and over, uh, I've done a decent amount of research with Nevadans and um, older Nevadans, and what they're telling me is that they are primarily interested in cannabis as a an alternative to replacing prescription medications that they're on. So, for example, pain medications, um, sleep medications, and you, this is totally understandable in a world where you know we're hearing all about the the the, the dangers of opioid dependence. Um, the idea that there is now a product that you can just walk into a store and it's labeled and it you know it's 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 and it's often medicalized, which I'll I'll have more thoughts about that. But you know, it it says how much THC is in it, how much CBD, and and they they feel like it's more like medicine, right? They can take a they can use creams, they can use an edible. To them, it feels more like a medicine, and it feels safe, and therefore um, they're interested in trying it out. Now, I the the older folks that I've spoken to about this, the majority of them say. I tried it, it worked for a little while, and then it stopped working. Essentially, they developed tolerance, and they got to a point where they weren't really willing to use more than that, and so they went back to their prescriptions. Okay, fine. Um, what the Really, the only thing that kind of came up there for me that was particularly concerning and that I would like to give you all a heads up is I heard a lot from older adults that they were unwilling to speak to their physicians or their pharmacists about cannabis use. They believed that, that either their physicians were not going to tell them the truth or that their physicians would lose their license if they did tell them the truth. And so that essentially their physicians were, um, were automatically not going to share true information with them. Um, and that makes me concerned only because of um, cross pharmaceutical interactions. So if you are on multiple pharmaceuticals and then you decide, you know, I don't like the side effects from my arthritis medication, I'm going to drop that. I'm going to try to replace it with cannabis. Um, you know, you talk to your, your friends, you talk to someone who works at a dispensary and they give you certain feedback, you decide to go with something, and then you don't disclose that with your physician or your pharmacist, we don't know if that's going to make certain medications less effective, if that's going to make certain medications um, more, I don't want to say not more effective, but we just don't know what's going to happen, right? And so I, I want to put that on your list of things to be aware of is perhaps you need to communicate with folks, both with physicians and pharmacists, about seniors 
um, concerns, then maybe they need to explicitly ask about cannabis use and say, look, I'm not going to judge you and this isn't illegal. It's fine. I just need to know. And on the other side, encourage people who are on medical, multiple medications to share this information with their physicians and to ask their physicians about what they know about cannabis. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing is um, we're seeing whispers in the data. And I say whispers because it's actually really hard to collect an adequate sample of pregnant women to answer this question. Um, but we're seeing whispers that pregnant women are um, turning to cannabis to deal with morning sickness in the first trimester. Um, and this, we've also seen a little bit of data on this from Colorado, for example. And unfortunately, they're getting this, this um, advice both from certain medical professionals, for example, um, perhaps uh, doulas or midwives. And uh, though I don't, I don't want to, I have midwife, a midwife friend who would say I would never, but uh, there's, there's a few people specifically in Las Vegas that I have in mind here. Um, and then also, um, unfortunately, uh, dispensary uh, employees who are giving medical advice that are not medical professionals. And so we really don't know what this is going to do. So prior research on cannabis use in pregnancy is really difficult to transfer to today because first of all, today's products are very different than the products that were you know, around even 10 years ago. But also a lot of women who use cannabis in pregnancy were also using tobacco, specifically smoking. So it's really hard to tell if the negative outcomes associated with cannabis and or tobacco use are due to cannabis or due to tobacco. There's, it's confounding. So, you know, when people ask me, like, is this a good idea? I go, I, I, I don't know. And this is part of my personal kind of values is what I want to see is truthful information that prioritizes the individual and not selling products to people. I, I center the individual here, not the company's, you know, goals of making money. And so if there's any sort of implicit or explicit health claim, I want to see that health claim backed up with gold standard data and not anecdote and not, well, we didn't say that explicitly, therefore it's not, it's okay. No, people have a right to truth and not being misled. And, and so I am concerned about this because, because I think women are probably thinking they're doing the best thing for themselves and their babies. And we don't know if that's true. I'm not gonna say, ah, it's terrible. You know, I don't have, never do that. We simply don't know. And I bet most pregnant women would not want to hear that they are guinea pigs. So, so that's my other concern about people over 21. Uh, any questions or, or anything about that? Ariel? Yeah, I, I do have a question about that. I mean, given what you're saying, given the lack of this data, if we wanted to have kind of a bud tender, and I don't know if that's the proper terminology, but yeah, uh, if, we, yeah, if we wanted to have a bud tender educational program, which we're required to do, I mean, what are we supposed to rely on to help educate the folks? Well, right? I, I, bud tenders are not medical professionals and should not be giving medical advice. Right. Done. Right. Right. If someone comes in and says, look, I'm having terrible morning sickness. Um, can you recommend a product for me to help me deal with that? The bud tender's uh, response is, no, I can't. Okay. But they might say, but anecdotally, you know, this strain over here might help. You know. That's the problem. Right. Okay. That is the problem. You are not medical professionals. You are not, you should not be giving medical advice. And, and I, you know, uh, when I look at, um, you know, descriptions of products on wheat apps, for example, for the, like, on the menus for Nevada dispensaries, um, I also see, not necessarily explicitly use this for morning sickness, but I see this product can reduce anxiety or this product, you know, and it's like, okay, great. Show me the data. Right? Um, because... Because for some people, yes, okay, for some people, cannabis does reduce anxiety. For some people, it amplifies anxiety. So, you know, I, I, these are all medical claims that need to be backed up with 
hard research, not anecdotal. Does Nevada have a uh, bud tender educational pro like certification that they that they have to go through? Yeah, but I don't know very much about it. Um, my impression is that it is mostly having to do with keeping um, you know Ill the illicit market and like organized crime out of out of the the, the legal market. Um, so so full disclosure, the Cannabis Advisory Commission is meeting for the first time next month. So I'm sorry, not next month, next week, next week. Okay. So I've had a lot of individual conversations with folks, but we have yet to officially do something like this. Okay. Yeah. Ours hasn't met yet either, for what it's worth. Yes, our, okay. Our, our advisory committee has not been assembled quite yet. Right, right, okay. Um, anything else? Not at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So for under 21, um, very interestingly, this is this is um, kind of my main focus, and um, we're doing a big analysis of youth risk behavior system uh, survey data. We're comparing states that legalized cannabis between 2017 and 2019 to those that just had medical campus cannabis. And what we're seeing is when you look at any past 30 day cannabis use, which is often kind of defined as current cannabis use among adolescents, any past 30 days. So that could be one time, that could be a thousand times in the past 30 days. You know, it covers a big range. Um, we don't see any, any evidence that legalization leads to an increase in past 30 day use. No, we don't, it's flat. And that's pretty consistent across um, a few different. Um, published uh, studies using different um, data sources. Uh, no, nope, haven't seen anything. However, and, and by the way, I should say that could change over, that could change, that could increase, decrease. We don't know that because keep in mind, that's just one year after legalization, right? So, so just keep that in mind. Um, among uh, students, high school students, like certainly it's flat. It kind of looks like if you're a past 30 day user in high school, you're already a, like you're going to be a past 30 day user, whether or not there's a legal environment or not. Among middle school students, we might be seeing a little increase. We see a little blip in Nevada data. Um, so essentially, we might be seeing a little bit younger age of initiation. Um, perhaps due to perceived norms, uh, perhaps due to lower perceived harm of getting caught with it, for example. Um, I've certainly heard that from young adults. Um, we, we haven't we haven't explicit, explicitly asked that of middle school students. But again, it's a blip. We're going to have to see if that st sticks around as those students mature. We have seen, however, a pretty decent increase in intensity or frequency of use among students who were already past 30 day users. So essentially, if you think about, you know, the, kind of the range of, of kiddos who have used cannabis in the past 30 days, the majority of them used once or twice, but we're seeing among states that legalized a shift towards a higher average number of, of times used in the past 30 days. And that, that looks pretty robust. We also see something like that among young adults. Um, and that data, that, that research is like currently ongoing right now. So, you know, give me a month and I can give you a point estimate, 95% confidence intervals and p-value. Um, so, and we're also seeing that uh, adolescents with a history of trauma, or with current mental distress like depression, uh, suicidality, um, anxiety, those are also the ones that are at highest risk of, of an increase in intensity and frequency. Those are already the kids who are the most likely to be uh, cannabis users or polysubstance users. And then those are also the ones that are seeing the biggest uh, average increase in frequency of use. And that is concerning because those are the kids who are the ones that are most likely to have long-term negative consequences due to substance use, not just cannabis, but just substance use in general. So, you know, when you think about how you're going to spend your public health dollars, um, you might want to try to focus intensely on the group that is going to have 
the greatest risk of long-term harm and honestly the greatest risk of being you know of using public resources for example uh, what you know whatever vermont's version of medicaid is you know um so you know it's both a practical and kind of a moral imp imperative um so yeah so that's that's my kind of general overview as to what's happening with cannabis use among adolescents in Nevada. Do you have any questions there? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I don't think you touched on this, but maybe you did. So maybe I, this question isn't relevant anymore, but um, you know, one of the early arguments um, for tax and regulate is that, you know, the person who's willing to sell a youth cannabis, they're also willing to sell you harder drugs or, you know, cocaine or heroin or something along those lines. Um, you know, that was at least an early argument that was being made. Um, so, you know, it, I'm wondering if you saw either a decrease or an increase in other drug usage, you know, 30-day drug usage post-legalization. Um, if anything, we're seeing a decrease in alcohol use. I'm not 100% sure that's going to stick around. Um, but if I had to bet, that's that's what I would bet. Okay. Thank you. And, yeah. And that's we're seeing that also in the monitoring the future data. Which is I natural. apologize. I, I missed something that you said. You said there was a younger age of initiation. Is that in states with medical legalization or retail and medical? I missed a piece of what retail you said. Retail and medical. Yeah, and I, I, but I'm specifically talking about Nevada. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I should have been more clear about that. Yeah, yeah. in Nevada data, uh, we are seeing uh, a trend towards younger age of initiation of cannabis among middle school students. So students ages 11 to 13, maybe. So we'll, you know, when we get the 2021 data, we'll we'll see if that's continuing. So so in that in that data, are you are you all looking at um, like differentiation of products, or is it just cannabis usage, generally speaking? Good question. So we have a question in the high school survey asking what was the most common way that uh, that they used cannabis, I'm sorry, in the high school and middle school, what was the most common way that they used cannabis in the past 30 days? And um, it's overwhelmingly it is smoked flour. But we saw a big increase, like a doubling of the proportion that said vaping cannabis between 2017 and 2019. Um, so among high school students, I believe it went from 7 to 14 percent. I don't wait. Was that middle school or high school? Mm. I would no, need to. Oh, yeah. yeah. Until we see a, it. <laughs> a bump. Yeah, a big old bump. And, and, you know, also when you're thinking about just data, that's our data has really shown that, like, Adolescents don't really differentiate between, like, vaping is vaping to them, and so you really got to ask them, what do you think you're vaping? Do you think you're vaping nicotine? Do you think you're vaping cannabis? Do you think you're just vaping flavors? Because, um, you know, a lot of researchers, especially from tobacco, we tend to think, oh, vaping means nicotine, and it's, it's like that just doesn't reflect how adolescents vape, not at all. And the products... I don't have one near me right now, but like, hey, I vape cannabis. I know <laughs> you can you can you can screw on like the 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 battery for for a vape can vape can vape a cartridge of containing whatever you want it to contain. It might be a little less efficient um, for vaping cannabis oil versus you know a nicotine solution, but like ultimately it'll work. And you know adolescents don't really care how you know what the experience is like. So um, it's a, that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Thank you. Yeah. So my, my final kind of thing, it's a little bit of a soapboxy thing, but um, we have quite the interesting advertising and marketing environment here in Nevada. So um, we used to require uh, dispensaries and brands to proactively get their uh, advertisements cleared, but then that switched to a passive kind of, you know, we'll come get you if you do something obviously against the rules approach in, uh, boy, like about a year and a half ago. So um, 
in my humble opinion, the Nevada standards leave very much to be desired when it comes to accurately conveying information and also when it comes to protecting people under 21 from seeing advertisements. Because the reality is, is that advertising 100% increases the use of our product. We see that for alcohol, we see that for tobacco. There's no reason why that's not gonna you know, translate to cannabis. However, cannabis is unusual because we have now a legal industry that can advertise and that has really strong age controls and does not sell to people under 21. Like that's, that's not been a problem in, in Nevada or anywhere else that I know of. They're really good at, at age controls. However, we have an unregulated, illicit market that, like you said, does not care what your age is. So essentially, you know, we're advertising products that, okay, perhaps specific brands aren't available on the illicit market, but the, the general concept of, of, you know, smoke and pot is, is being promoted and then is easily accessible to people under 21. So this is kind of a unique environment where I think we really need to be careful about the specificity of, of marketing channels, meaning, you know, billboards, that's the buckshot of advertising. You know, you can't say no one under 21 is going to walk past this billboard, right? Uh, most states say you can't put a billboard within 500 or a thousand feet of a school. Well, that's nice. Kids go outside, like beyond that, right? And in fact, in Nevada, where are they put? They're put on major highways, which makes perfect sense. You want to get as many eyeballs on it as possible. But those eyeballs are of all ages. So if I had my druthers, Nevada would not have billboards because they are non-specific advertising that does not restrict to, for example, you know, a, a channel that the general kind of standard is if this magazine or this website or this, you know, whatever channel has a 30% or greater underage viewership, then you cannot place the advertisement there, right? You can't say such a thing about billboards. It just doesn't exist. So, you know, we have certain content standards, but those content standards, clearly a bunch of adults got together in a room and were like, what do kids like? And they were said cartoons and candy and, you know, no sports, you know, uh, sponsorships, which is fine. But the reality is, is that there are lots of other things that kids find appealing. And there are a lot of the same things that adults find appealing. So things like, um, you know, we have a we have a brand here uh, that um, features uh, ski skiers and mountain bikers and um, and people doing yoga and it's it's a wellness angle, but it is very it came up so many times. I did a, 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 a like, gosh, eight focus groups with youth all over Nevada, both rurally and in, and in our major cities, and that stuff came up over and over and over again. So, you know, I, I do encourage you to think kind of very critically about, you know, how you're going to protect people under the age of 21 from, from seeing advertisements. Um, and then my final point is that I think in, in Nevada and I think in most states, um, the kind of medicalization and the medical approach to, um, to cannabis, to, to medical cannabis, has leaked over into the recreational market. So for example, we have a recreational dispensary here where all of the employees wear scrubs and lanyards like they're medical employees. Um, this to me is going back to my kind of fundamental, you know, center the individual, people deserve uh, uh, accurate information. This to me gives, puts a medical halo around a recreational product and misleads people into thinking that what they're getting is perhaps a medicine. Now, people who go to medical dispensaries after getting, you know, a, a, a prescription from a physician, they're working with a physician, hopefully, though I understand that's not always how it works, but, you know, they have a purpose. They go into a, a medical dispensary, I like, fine, okay, that's a different situation. But a recreational dispensary, um, to me, even the concept of a dispensary, it, it's, it's a little, um, it's medicalizing. It is 
we don't consider a liquor store to be an alcohol dispensary. We don't consider a, a tobacco store to be a nicotine dispensary. If it's a recreational cannabis shop, it is that's what it is. It's not a recreational cannabis dispensary. And so I encourage you to kind of step back and think, what is it about about the medical um, the medical uh, uh, regulatory framework that we should keep? And what about it is perhaps not appropriate for a recreational drug? It is a recreational drug now. <laughs> um, and, and it also, you have to think about the seniors, for example, who are hoping that this product will help them deal with some issue. And think about the people under 21 who perhaps are, are, are getting a, a misunderstanding of the potential pros and cons of cannabis use because of this framing, right? It is, I, I, I want to just universally center the individual the individual deserves truth in advertising and 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 the the, the companies should should kind of their 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 goals of of you know promoting their products should be lower than the goal of communicating truthful information to individual, individuals so that is that's it <laughs> i do have just i know we're running a little short on time i apologize because yeah. this has been incredibly insightful and you know talking to someone who's been through it um you know for a few years now is just exactly what we need to be doing um how long until we have some some like hard science i mean i know like people always kind of quote israel as being a few years ahead maybe canada some of these other countries but you know when i talk to my primary uh care physician about cannabis um you know she doesn't really know a lot about it she's prescribed it to, to some of her patients but you know it, it just isn't part of the training there's not a lot of hard science out there and so how do we you know if blood tenders can't give this kind of advice and doctors aren't really willing to or maybe they don't have the kind of hard science like how, how where i mean where does that leave us really well um from a regulatory perspective i think that leaves you at um, it, I think it's like kind of easier for you, honestly, because th if the answer is, I don't know, yeah. you know, so does this reduce anxiety? I mean, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Then the, answer, the truth is, I don't know, right? And therefore, the company, the, in, in, the, in a world of I don't know, a company does not get to promote the, you know, therapeutic, uh, values of their product in that world. Now, I, I think though, I still think that's coming from a very medical perspective, that question. Yeah. From a public health perspective, as a recreational drug, which I think is utterly 100% appropriate, like we should be thinking about this product as a recreational drug, right? Like it, we would never ask the question, should, should bullet whiskey be allowed to claim that using their product reduces anxiety. I can tell you that it does. I have used it that way. Right? <laughs> but like, it's a recreational drug. Yeah. None of us yeah. are wondering, like, it, we don't have the data. Should, should, we, should we or should we not? Like, no, it's, it's a recreational drug. Like, that's, it's, that's not an appropriate claim. Now, if that, if Bullet wants to go through the the regulatory process in order to be recognized as a medicine and make medical claims, then they should go for it. But if you're talking about re medical or recreational drugs, it's kind of a moot point. Like just, it's, yeah. it's recreational. Yeah, you're both, both yep, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Pearson? Uh, I don't know if it's a question, but it, well, I found what you said about billboards interesting. We, we actually don't have billboards for anything in Vermont, but New York State is only an hour from my house, or less than an hour from my house, and they have billboards. And well, and I don't know what they'll do about their cannabis advertising yet, because they're still coming online, right? Right. Um, and the same is true with Massachusetts, and I'm not sure. I haven't been to Massachusetts since COVID started, so I don't know what... <laughs> what their know. rules are, but it no. makes me wonder, and I guess I'm saying this to one of my colleagues, if there's a regional conversation to be had. For sure. Mm -hmm. At least for our own awareness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. And and I um, 
I don't know if you've looked at um, Canada's um, warning label either on their products, but they they do a great job. I mean, it's not billboard related, but they do a great job um, with their warning labels because they are just straightforward. You know, we don't know what's going to happen if you use cannabis in pregnancy. The end. <laughs> you know, uh, that to me, that's a very compelling warning label. Like, okay. <laughs> um, you know, and, and they rotate them so that they stay fresh. And, um, and, and so, you know, I think there's a lot that Canada is doing right. And you might, you might want to take a look, look, take a look at them. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank really you. Really can't thank you enough for your time. And uh, I, you know, I have your email address, so I might yes. be reaching. Uh, yeah. Please do. Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, right. you're welcome. I'm gonna move on to my next meeting. Y'all have a <laughs> great, great uh, afternoon. Yeah, you do the same. Thank you. Bye. So um, our next witness, um, I think, has joined us. Um, yeah, John, are you with us? I'm gonna turn it over to you, Kyle, to introduce John. Um, Hey, what's up, everyone? A little bit of his background. Hey, John. Um, glad that you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, John Chute is the CEO of Puff Creative. John, I know that, and I, I might mess up your, your accolades. I know that CEO Magazine has named you Colorado CEO of the year before. You've run Marketer of the year before. You've been operating in this space in Colorado for, for some time. I know you have clients in many jurisdictions around the country that you know, are operating in a a legal market. Um, John is also a graduate of Norwich's MBA program, so he is familiar with Vermont, and I know he cares about Vermont and the communities that we have here. And I know um, his organization is very community centric. I know he has the same of his clients. Um, so, with that introduction, John, I may have left something out, but but I'm going to turn it over to you. I think you can re-enable this. Camera. Hey, no, that that was perfect. Thanks, thanks, Kyle. Um, Hello everyone, uh, Eric Kautz, my name is John Shute, CEO of Puff Creative. Super honored to be here. Uh, like Kyle said, you know, I, I lived in Vermont for three years. I graduated from Norwich's MBA program. So um, these types of conversations are really fun to be a part of and come close to the heart. Um, my agency, we've been around for like five years now. Uh, I've been in marketing for, I think, eight or nine um, originally in nightlife and hospitality, transitioning into cannabis. Um, you know, honestly, the original reason I got in is because I had so many friends struggle with um, opiates uh, being from New Jersey, and a lot of them used cannabis to help get off of opiates. Um, and that kind of inspired me to get involved in the industry. And it's been a whirlwind since, you know, I was listening on the last conversation uh, being in marketing and advertising, the rules change, I feel like, <laughs> daily sometimes. Uh, and my clients deal with a lot of headaches, too. We work in about 20, 20, 20 or so different states, some international uh, work as well. Um, so it's a lot of moving pieces all at once. Um, we handle a lot of people who just have money and an idea. Uh, so we're starting people from like square one in their projects and we offer services such as logo design, branding, messaging, packaging design. Uh, we do brand books and go to market strategies. We also lead into, you know, custom website design development. Uh, once that, you know, launches, we do SEO, social media, email marketing, uh, photo, video. And then we have a bunch of different strategic partners we use for public relations and certain advertising solutions. Um, advertising is pretty tricky in cannabis. Uh, each platform has its own set of rules and regulations that we constantly have to navigate. Um, so, and as Kyle mentioned, you know, we do a ton of different community work all over the country and all of our clients uh, are pretty much required at this point to do some type of community or environmental give back. Um, so it's really fun to uh, help local communities all around the country. I think we've, through our one program, we've raised almost $300,000 the past three or so years for different nonprofits all over the country. Uh, and we recently just partnered with the, with Last Prisoner Project, 40 Tons Brand, and, re and released our own uh, educational guidebook series, which is, which is really fun. Um, anyway, that's kind of my spiel about, about us, us and our perspective and my company. 
I know uh, today we wanted to touch on um, child compliance. You know, I got brought into the conversation because, you know, the, from a marketing advertising standpoint. Um, and as I mentioned, we deal with um, companies from the start. So child compliance comes into play right away uh, in the conversations that we have. Um, each state that we do work in, they all have their own separate rules and regulations around child compliance throughout an entire marketing life cycle. Um, there is a lot of crossover and similarities, um, but it does get a little bit tricky. So we end up having to work pretty closely with different folks, uh, you know, in the packaging side of things and the product development side of things and the advertising side of things, because there needs to be a lot of eyes on marketing and advertising materials. Um, you know, another thing I mentioned is that each channel differs in rules and regulations, so we're constantly navigating that as well. Uh, for example, um, you know, cannabis clients are at risk of getting their social media shut down uh, just out of nowhere. It seems like cannabis profiles are plugged into even their own algorithm, uh, which is pretty interesting and makes my job uh, really busy. Um, but, you know, the early conversations that we have with clients, no matter what the state, are, you know, what their product selection is. Uh, and how that relates to child compliance is there are brands out there in certain states, uh, not all states, but certain ones that have products such as gummy worms, um, or, you know, something that, you know, children are already consuming when they go to like a, you know, candy store or something like that. Um, so that's something that we, we talk about very early on before we even do any type of marketing work. Um, you know, in that case, you know, sometimes clients will just want to change the product, the product. Um, or if it's something they want to, if they want to be on teetering on, you know, if they just want to do a gummy, um, and that, you know, that child conversation gets brought up, a uh, big point that's made is, you know, how are we going to brand and educate the consumer, uh, and people in the dispensaries who are selling the project, the bud tenders, um, on how to properly market that product, uh, safely. Um, after we, after a product selected and we, we do a go-to market strategy for those products, uh, we dive into the branding side of things. So in that case, you know, first step would be creating a logo design and brand name uh, leading into the messaging. Um, in regards to, you know, um, child compliance and child safety, uh, a big, you know, topic of conversation always is not having a, you know, cart a cartoonish style logo um, or something that's already ch child related. Um, there actually is pretty big brands out there in multiple states uh, and some some smaller brands in a lot of the states too who kind of teeter uh, on that edge in that gray area and definitely have a lot of eyes on them uh, at the moment um, that kind of goes back to just you know marketing and advertising and just cannabis <laughs> rules in general being pretty pretty early on you know, in the grand scheme of things um, so anyway a big you know a big point uh, that we try to do is to make it clear through the design of a brand and also the messaging that corresponds with the brand, uh, who that product is for, uh, who that product is going to be attractive to, and how that product's gonna be incorporated into people's lives. Um, you know, kind of teetering off the last conversation uh, or piggybacking off the last conversation, um, you know, there is the, the medical and recreational side of things too. Um, so depending on if a brand is medical, depending on if a brand is recreational, uh, some brands are both. Uh, throughout the life cycle, there kind of are some differentiations that have come up. Um, after we brand, the, after we do the logo design and some uh, basic messaging for a brand, we'll typically go into the packaging uh, side of things. Um, again, during this part of the life cycle, we work pretty closely with different lawyers and also the packaging companies and their attorneys. Uh, just to make sure everything is dialed in and there's no questions or risk because a lot of times folks have to purchase you know minimum orders you know 30,000 units 100,000 units uh, so there's not really any room for mistake all around especially when it comes to the the child compliance side of things a lot of the different states or pretty much all of them uh, have a THC symbol uh, that for products that are sold out of the cannabis dispensary uh, and that symbol I think ranges state to state uh, and it changes every now and then, and it can be tricky for certain um, uh, brands to navigate when they have to make those minimum, minimum orders. Uh, also, each state has a separate verbiage that they put on their packaging. Uh, again, there is crossover there between states, but each one kind of has their own little niches and uh, you know variances within that messaging on the packaging as well. 
Uh, and some states even can uh, allow, you know, 18 plus or 21 plus on the packaging, depending on uh, if it's medical or recreational. Um, another, another big point on the packaging is depending on how your product is packaged, um, we actually take that opportunity to educate folks. So if you can include additional marketing material in your packaging or boxes that comes in, uh, that's a really great way to educate to, you know, who your target consumer is, um, you know, how they consume the product and what it's actually for. Um, you know, after that, uh, you know, we, we usually do a brand book uh, that dials in the messaging even further and all that will correlate onto the website. Uh, the website is typically the first touch point besides the physical location of most of the consumers uh, who go into the dispensaries to make um, purchases. Uh, the first thing that happens when you go to a website is an age gate portal. Um, that's something that you know identified with you know be related to this conversation. And what happens is as soon as you land on that site, uh, depending on if your dispensary is if you're a medical purchaser or a uh, recreational purchaser, um, you have to plug in your birth date, uh, sometimes additional info depending on the state to even get into uh, the website itself. Um, other, you know, a lot of dispensaries, a lot of cannabis brands use their website as well uh, to, to publish educational material for folks and their consumers. Uh, in some states that we've worked in, um, I believe that we've put, we plugged in, you know, a lot of different um, child safety and like parent safety and parent education. Uh, material in the websites and the blogs or you know shared links on social media related to those topics uh, there are there there is a lot of um, fun and really helpful information out there if you start diving into it um, which is which is really cool um, brands and organizations also like to put just like basic 101 information about different products um, how they're used you know the science behind them uh, consumption recommendations on you know how to properly consume or utilize a product and uh, the other safety information. Uh, most, you know, companies, for example, like an edibles company will have, you know, start, start small, you know, microdose, uh, you know, you can always take more uh, concept uh, for consumers. Um, another aspect of the digital marketing, and sorry, I'm just like blurting all this out. I don't know if I should stop and answer questions or not, but should I just keep going? You're, you're doing, yeah, I mean, you just get to a okay. point where, where you're ready for questions. Okay, cool. I'll be there in a little bit here. Um, so yeah, the next uh, area, you know, a big area where I think you know children and and you know younger folks are uh, have access to to the brands or organizations or dispensaries is social media. Uh, certain platforms and a lot of platforms actually have age gates on them themselves. Uh, what's great about social is a lot of times I believe birthdays are associated with it. Um, so, you know, the, 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 they'll be able to verify that age before they can even go to the page. Um, but not all social platforms actually do this. Uh, I believe every state or at least every brand that we work with or dispensary we work with, uh, they have an age uh, limitation in their bios as well to make it clear, you know, who the consumers are who are allowed to view the products or the information on those pages. Um, uh, basic rule of thumb for cannabis brands and dispensaries especially, uh, is having no consumption content. Um, that seems to be just something that either gets flagged on social media pages uh, and, and is just kind of foul play. Uh, and it's been a rule of thumb since I first got into the industry about six years ago or so. Um, we try to stay away from call to action content on social media as well. We try to stay away from po posting pricing information. Uh, and we also try to stick to more educational fo focus. Um, which, which is great. Um, social media can be a really, really critical tool for brands to get solid info out there. But again, there's just a lot of limitations there. Um, but there is ways to kind of keep the, the content safe and also um, limit who is viewing that content, which is nice. Um, same thing with advertising. And from my perspective, you know, you can view ad advertising as like a digital advert ad or also a physical ad. I know there was billboards talked about in the last conversation um, and there, it was mentioned, you know, Vermont doesn't have billboards, but New York does. It's a really cool point. Uh, we work with a lot of different dispensaries that are on state borders and a lot of their sales come from outside states and a lot of advertising physically and digitally is done in those states, even though some of them aren't necessarily legal yet. Uh, so from an advertising marketing perspective, 
Um, the, the, each state has its own set of advertising rules and limitations, but typically um, the content that we put out from a design perspective is just very well branded, has the main information, you know, location, what the business is, uh, and most dispensaries and brands in general are kind of sticking away from using green and, and cannabis leaves. Um, some advertisers don't allow that type of content at all. Um, in some cases, we have to get really creative and do some type of collaborative partnership for ads. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a lot of the areas that like we face like on the day to day in regards to you know child compliance or you know child safety is brought up and something that we need to consider. Um, most of the time, we're, we're again we're working with different attorneys all across the board uh, and different compliance officers. Uh, to make sure everything's on point. There's a whole approval process for each one of the deliverables we put out. Um, so yeah, in that case, I guess I can just leave. I think that's all I had to say. So I'll, I'll let any questions or Thanks, John. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. Any questions for John? Yeah, um, I have a question for you, John. How has, when you're talking about um, packaging, how have various retail operations handled, you know, labeling their packaging with the strain um, in such a way that it doesn't look appealing, even when the, the theme of the strain maybe is a superhero name? There are quite a few of those. Or other names that just by the name, birthday cake, for example, might be appealing to children. How do they handle that? I mean, you see it across the board. Um, fortunately for us in those situations, we advise our clients to again you know be as safe and long term as possible um a lot of our clients won't even select those names that are in that gray area um we i i i personally have just been noticing as of recently there being certain lawsuits um because of that i believe skittles i want to say is in the middle of a suit right now with a strain that's very similar to the name um so for us personally we always advise and work with attorneys to teeter away from that and not even advise brands against those strains and also if they are using those strains they for the creative not to have like for if it's birthday cake or cupcake strain or something like that um to not have it be child childlike um so it'd be more of like cleaner focusing on the colors of the brand um to stay away from that but that being said you know like i mentioned earlier there's brands all over the country um who, who don't or are not you know practicing that so you know, as from what we see, I, I feel like things are going to be uh, a bit more clean, you know, stricter as, as, as things progress in cannabis. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. I'll pass it on. Okay, yeah. Pass it on. I, yeah. I, thanks for joining us, John. Um, yeah. So, you know, we as a board are going to have to approve every advertisement. Um, we have that authority under our law. Um, some of the restrictions that we have, the prohibited advertising or any advertisement that appeals to a youth under 21, how should we as a board think about that? I know you mentioned the kind of cartoon colors and the kind of, um, you know, certain Font. elements, fonts, but, you know, we also just heard from, you know, uh, Dr. Pearson that, you know, like trying to appeal to people like, you know, associating us with like snowboarding or extreme sports or something like that might also appeal to a youth under 21. Um, so how should we as a board be trying to evaluate that question of whether this appeals to a person under 21? Um, I mean, it, it's definitely going to be tricky. I think the best way to help avoid it initially is um, bring up these points to brands and businesses who get license approvals before they even really get started. Um, you know, as I mentioned, like we're having these conversations and before the, these, these brands are even coming to life, uh, when it comes to like, you know, and I guess from an advertising perspective, it's all about reach. Um, for us, you know, I thought, I think snowboarding is a good topic cause yeah, like it could apply to, so, to someone younger. Um, for us, you know, content, uh, that is more questionable is more exposed on like the organic side of things. So, um, you know, very small campaigns here and there, whereas like big advertisements on like billboards or um, large digital campaigns with like big advertisers, um, there needs to be more of like a, a safety check 
um, you know, and, and guidelines before anyone even touches any creative, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, you can save people like me a lot of the time uh, of going back and forth with folks like you, you know, if those types of things are just like set in stone, like, hey, you can't have anything related to lifestyle content, consumption, um, you know, call to action style content. Um, it almost seems like there could be, and in some states there is this, you know, limitations on the specific info um, that can even be on there. Um, so that's, that's really helpful. I, I got one more for you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so I think we have in our, you know, we have a statutory structure around advertising. We have to develop specific rules around it. Um, you know, we have a pretty typical, but I think it's actually more restrictive than most states that, you know, we can't have any advertisement in a publication or a medium that where 15% of the audience is reasonably expected to be under 21. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've worked in a few states where they have something similar, you know, Nevada being one of them, we just heard has a 30%. Yeah. Um, how do we, how do we go about evaluating that? I mean, obviously some things would be easy, television, billboards, uh, you know, things like that, but, um, you know, certain types of magazines, but I'm trying to think like, yeah, so, we... yeah, so there, you, you'll see, um, like, you know, a lot, some, some states will not allow them anywhere except for dispensaries. And in that case, there's actually can, this cannabis specific magazines, um, that you'll only find in dispensaries. Uh, and that's like a cool, a cool way for brands and, and, and stuff like that to get the, get the word out there safely. Um, because even enter the dispenser yourself, there's the ID check typically at the at the front door. Um, so that that's like one one solution there. Um, how how to check like how each publication and business um, and how to regulate that? I, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure. What I do know is that when any time that we do a campaign with an advertiser, whether it's a local, national, international, um, you know, same thing with publications, print. Uh, et cetera, they each have their own set of state uh, regulations and guidelines that they send to us um, that we that we follow when we're kind of, um, you know, executing any type of campaign. So, um, you know, for example, like I think in some situations, uh, not, I can't pinpoint the state exactly, but I want to say um, there's that percentage rule in a few different states or um, one that we're doing advertising in. And the only thing that could be on the ad is literally just the logo, uh, nothing else. That's it. <laughs> um, and some brands will like pay to, pay to do that. And I think that's how um, certain magazines are, are playing it safe. But again, I, I know a lot of the states and a lot of the publications and advertisers are just not even allowing it in general. Um, so. I got one quick, I got one quick follow up, um, John. Yeah, thank I, you. I actually, I actually had a question for you guys. Um, Great. In that in that regard is, uh, you know, that is going to be tricky to, to track because there is, you know, if you look at um, display ad uh, campaigns, so like the ads you see on like bigger, larger websites, um, I guess it's not really a question, just something to bring your attention. But, you know, there's display ad agencies all over the country that just have ads that pop up on the sites. And that's a huge uh, play for big cannabis organizations, I'm sure. Probably a lot of people on this call have seen some for big companies like Weed Maps. Um, you mean like so, if I'm just on a website, all those ads that pop up on the side? Yeah, yeah. They, they, those those websites partner with different like display ad uh, agencies. Um, so I think that network. yeah. So it's um, you know I think that the display ad people from a digital perspective they follow more federal guidelines, um, and they're, they're going to be a bit harder to probably track. Um, well, thanks for putting it on our radar. Keep on your radar. Yeah, thanks yeah. for putting it on our radar. Um, I had one quick follow up, I guess, well, to this and to Pepper's point um, earlier around, you know, what can what can we do on this fifteen percent rule? Because you you know, I know that you mentioned social as being a medium that that businesses in this space are really looking to, and you know, kids these days are on every single platform. How, like, in your experience, and I've, I'm actually, I never really thought about it from the perspective of birthdays and, like, ads kind of getting tracked from your age perspective, too, on Facebook and Twitter and so and Instagram and TikTok or whatever the case may be. But and I know you said that not every platform utilizes that type of technology, but but are, is that effective? Like, are they good at, 
I mean, I know a kid can put in a fake birthday if they really want to, right? But like, how effective are those, you know, gatekeepers? Yeah, so I think it it, it ranges. Um, again, like we do our due diligence. So a lot of the different like digital plug, like from a website perspective, um, it really depends on the plugin and the technology that you utilize. Um, and it is effective in some cases. Um, but again, like, yeah, there are, there totally are, are workarounds and there's going to be developments and there are developments that are happening every day from a website perspective on compliance and safety and like how people can actually get into websites. Um, on the social media side of things, it is a little bit more effective, especially if, um, you know, one's Instagram and Facebook are, are linked. Um, but again, there, there are platforms, you know, like Twitter, for example, um, I think, uh, you know, TikTok, um, there are no, you know, a like age verifications on those. But in those cases, you know, same thing with Facebook and Instagram, um, accounts get plugged into an algorithm. That's what social media is now. Uh, in, in, on every platform, there's limitations with cannabis. So uh, in most cases, the content that is allowed to go through on business profiles for cannabis accounts, especially dispensaries and brands who are making actual sales. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's tricky and like, you have to be safe anyway. So, um, yeah, I think, I, I think, I think over the next, I would say, you know, even just one to five years, the technology on, um, plugins and ver and verifications and whatnot is going to be drastically different, but there's still, there's still a long way to go all around in the industry. Thanks, John. Yeah, I really appreciate you. it. We're on a little bit of a tight time. Yeah, no here. worries. I know I started a little late too. I tried to squeeze no, it all in. Um, no, I, I, you know, we certainly appreciate it. I think this is not the end of the marketing advertising conversation as we get going. So we're hopeful we can tap into your knowledge somewhere down the road. Yeah, more than happy to talk anytime. I hope uh, everyone has a great rest of the day. I really appreciate you having me. Thanks, Thank John. You. Thank you. So. Right. Nick, right. Next on our agenda is public comment. Um, we have very little time, unfortunately. Uh, we do have some uh, folks scheduled for our executive session at, at 2.45. So if people have public comment, um, could you please raise your digital hand? Um, and we're going to try and limit it to one minute per person. I see um, Dr. Ant. Ant Feel free to unmute yourself and put your video on if you would like. Dr. Anley, are you with us? If you just uh, unmute yourself, you can provide public comment. All right, well, while we wait for Dr. Antley, is there anyone else um, that would like to provide public comment right now? Please just raise your digital hand. Hi, it's, it's Catherine Antley. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks for taking my my call. I just a um, couple things um, I, we wanted to comment on. So I'm a member of a group that's recently formed International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis. We have world leaders on medicine and cannabis, and our website is i a s i c the number one dot org. What's nice about that? the sure I like Isabel A like Anne S like Sam I like Isabel and C like Cat the number one dot org. And what's nice about that website is that there's a library there which is useful for physicians, but it's also useful for lay people, and it organizes um, all of a lot of the literature, pertinent literature, all of the articles you'll find there are well done powerful you know controlled studies um and they're actually like 15,000 uh, peer review articles on cannabis at this point so that's like the one of the more important things i wanted to talk about the other thing is this issue of kids not increasing use there's a couple of issues with that one is for example in colorado half of the state has opted out but that number includes the whole state and i just heard testimony in boston um last week 
And they've done studies on a granular level, a little bit like what Holly Morehouse was talking about. And they're finding increased use, you know, in a particular school. Um, and so it's, it's, it's and, the, and the other piece to that is that if you look at the ER data, Colorado and, and is seeing, and, and so is California, huge increases in kids showing up in the ER for these, you know, poisoning, psychotic episodes, um, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So it's like your your expert witness, you know, said you're you're you are having some kids, the kids that are using, are using really high potency and a lot of product. And I don't know, you must have heard there was a, a bill that just went through Colorado last week where a lot of the te the legislators testified that their own kids had been, you know, caught up in this. And um, so they're they're trying to do what you're doing right now. You know, let's decrease the, the the THC. Let's get this, you know, the candies, the sweets, the advertising out of this um, so we don't have this this problem in, in from a lot of... I know you've got a lot of other people to talk to. Talk, uh, um, yeah. well, thank like you. To thank share. you yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for the resource. Um, yeah, it was you. directly responsive to a couple of our questions today. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Um, I'm going to stop public comment there. I don't see anyone else's hand raised. Um, and uh, I w just next on our um, agenda is to move into executive session. Um, so I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to move into executive session to um, uh, discuss our consultant finalists. Um, so I would move uh, to move into executive session to discuss our consultant finalist. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So Kyle, could you please pause?